So a break. We are now going to move on to the public hearing portion of uh, this meeting, starting with agenda item number 29. In So, simultaneous Spanish interpretations are being provided for this meeting using the language interpretation function within Zoom. <clears throat> we ask that you please be patient in case of any technical issues. Language interpretation will not be enabled until instructions on how to access interpretation have been translated into Spanish. <clears throat> Once interpretation has been enabled, the globe, a globe icon will appear at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, it's an important reminder to all those who are presenting and commenting today, we ask that you speak slowly for our interpreters. If you're speaking too fast, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak slower uh, so this translator can catch up with uh, all the information. Thank you. <clears throat> to enable interpretation for Spanish, please click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and select Spanish. You must also mute original audio. Uh, one, will you now uh, interpret the instructions I gave into Spanish? Good evening, Madam Chair, about the happy to. Muy buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal, el intérprete para español. El servicio de interpretación simultánea en español está siendo ofrecido en esta reunión utilizando las funciones de interpretación vía Zoom. Por favor, sea paciente en caso de presentarse algún problema técnico. El icono de la interpretación no va a ser habilitado hasta que se interpreten todas las instrucciones en español. Una vez habilitada la función de interpretación, un icono de un globo aparecerá en la parte inferior baja derecha de sus pantallas. Es importante también recordarle a todos aquellos que estén presentando el día de hoy hablar despacio para poder asistir la interpretación completa de todos los intérpretes. Es posible que se tenga que interrumpir a aquel presentador que esté hablando demasiado rápido. Para habilitar la interpretación en español, haga un clic sobre el globo que aparece en la parte inferior de sus pantallas. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Back to you. Gracias, Juan. Um, Ani, will you now please activate the interpretation function? And we'll give folks a few, uh, a minute or so to join. Um, as you can see, the globe icon has now appeared at the bottom. So if you would like Spanish interpretation, uh, just click it and select Spanish. Okay, so I'm gonna start reading the next section. Um, to test out that we've got everything activated. Uh, if you are having any difficulty activating the interpretation, please call the phone number on the screen. If you have any difficulties with the translation later in the meeting, you can call the same number. We have interpreters available to assist you over the phone. Uh, the project presentation has been translated into Spanish and is available on the BPDA website at bostonplans.org slash about dash us slash BPDA dash board slash board dash meetings. Please take note of the website address on the screen to view the translated project presentation. Um, Secretary Joe Bohemus, I'm just confirming that the uh, the interpretation function is, is good to go. Yes, it is. Perfect, okay. So this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Articles 3-1A, 80A-2, and 80C of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed project 495 Dorchester Avenue or on the dot, on the dot phase 1A. This hearing was duly advertised on January 6, 2024 in the Boston Herald. This was a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. If you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active and click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. 
Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to ten minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. And now Mr. Carter will begin the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Chief Jamison, and Secretary Bolinas. I'm here before you this evening to present 495 Dorchester Avenue in the development plan for phase 1A of the master plan for plan development area number 144, 475 to 511 Dorchester Avenue, also known as Core on the Dot, which was approved by this board in October of last year. Located in South Boston on Dorchester Avenue, roughly between Broadway and Andrews Station, 495 Dorchester Avenue represents the first building in phase one of the master plan. The, propo the, sorry, the proposed project calls for the construction of a new 237 unit market rate, 16 story residential building and a new seven story 94 unit income restricted mid-rise building for seniors joined by a shared podium. The proposed project will contain approximately 326,000 square feet of gross floor area, including approximately uh, 11,710 square feet of ground floor retail and commercial space and below grade parking. The senior mid-rise building will have dedicated amenities and services common to ship and services common to service enriched senior housing, as well as full access to shared amenities within the planned community, such as a gym, social activities, retail services, and newly created open space. The programming will include supportive services to enhance the resident experience and quality of life and to maintain independent living as they age. Rogerson's Communities has agreed to be the service partner for the project and will bring their very thorough program of services, coordination, dedicated and community-based services to the senior community. Before I turn to my colleague, Ted Schwartzberg, who will take you through the planning context, I want to acknowledge the letter of support we received this afternoon from Councilor Flynn. John Sazel from the development team will then begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I think uh, the planning context slides are next. Thank you, my name is Ted Schwartzberg. I'm a planner in the BPDA Zoning Compliance Department. Good evening, Chair Rojas and members of the board. I wanted to review three slides uh, that give an overview of the planning department's review of uh, this project in light of the planning and zoning context. Uh, the zoning for this area, I'm sorry, this is an older version of the slide, but the uh, zoning for this area, as Nick had noted earlier, is uh, planned development area number 144, and this zoning overlay was approved by this board last year and the zoning commission. Uh, this proposal is compliant with that zoning overlay. It's also compliant with CFRAD, CFRAD the Coastal Flood Resilience Overlay District. Uh, in addition to the zoning, the planning that the uh, planning staff considered was Plain South Boston, and this is in the heart of that planning study area. Next slide, please. Key considerations from that planning area uh, are uh, dimensions, and this is the portion of the planning study area that had some of the greatest heights and densities. Uh, the uses that were envisioned are mixed-use residential, ground floor retail, commercial offices, R&D, and civic cultural uses. The plan envisioned the creation of a network of new streets on private property through a series of new setbacks to create rights of way and also the creation of a series of public open spaces on what is now private property. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, proposal that you'll see uh, is consistent with Plan.Av, which subsequently informed the current zoning, the overlay that is PDA 144, as well as the C fraud district. Uh, it's consistent with uh, dimensions from the plan, uh, as well as uses which emphasize a minimum percentage of residential use. Uh, and as I noted earlier, this proposal builds out an armature of streets and public spaces uh, through the creation of these new networks on private uh, property. And that concludes the planning context. Thank you very much. Can I just interrupt before we continue and to remind the speakers to speak slowly for the interpreters, please? Thank you. Madam Chairman and Secretary, Director Jamison, thank you. We're grateful once again to be before you with the first building in the master plan and the PD development plan. Uh, tonight, I just get to say thank you to a lot of people, including uh, the BPDA staff. Thank you, Ted and Nick, for the introduction and 
for the entire staff that has helped shepherd this along and through to tonight. We're excited to bring the first building of many in the master plan. And we're particularly thankful for, again, the continuous community support that we've received in our neighborhood of Andrew Square. And of course, the support we received from Andrew Square Civic Association. It's been outstanding dialogue and continuous journey with the neighborhood and the community. We're also extremely thankful for the elected officials from South Boston and the greater city councilors who have supported us, along with the IAG that continues to journey with us over the years here in these projects. So a lot of, a lot of people to be thankful for. I'm going to hand it over to a team that will then usher us through the deck tonight and look forward to your feedback at the end of uh, the presentation. Thank you, John. Um, Madam Chairman, Secretary, Director, uh, Jameson, members of the board, uh, one quick request. There are two individuals who have their hands up, Paula Devereaux and Michael LeBlanc. They are members of the presentation team, and I would ask if you could uh, promote them. Michael, in particular, is our architect who is supposed to do most of the talking. Um, my name is Mark Rosenstein. I'm the owner's project manager. Next slide. Very quick context with which Nick and John have touched base. This is part of uh, this is phase one which was part of the 21-acre master plan that was before you uh, late last year. Phase one consists of nine acres, which are outlined here. Next slide, please. Within those nine acres, there are four proposed buildings, 505, 75, 65 are commercial, 495 is residential. Tonight, we are here for phase 1A. We worked with the BPDA staff to carve out the residential speed piece, 495 Dorchester Avenue specifically, for this phase 1A in order to comply with timing associated with low income housing tax credit and affordable housing funding rounds. Next slide, please. And so what Michael will be presenting to you is specifically as outlined in this blue box, phase 1A, which is a 331 unit residential building, including 94 units of uh, senior affordable housing. And we will be bringing before you 505, 7565, the open spaces and the ROWs in future months. Tonight, we're focused on the residential portion. And I apologize for talking that quickly. Michael, talk slow. I will. Thank you, Mark. Um, OK, next slide, please. So uh, just real quickly, this is a, uh, a kind of drone shot view uh, or rendering of, of the, all of the nine acres that we're, that we're um, kind of uh, focused on these days, but specifically on phase 1A, which is at the right-hand side of the screen, which is our residential building. Next slide. Uh, in this uh, east to west um, uh, section here, a uh, couple things I wanted to point out. First is that we are trying to uh, use the building's massing to, to uh, address the, the two scales we have on either side of the building. There's the dot .av scale and the existing context, which is there. There's also the Ellery Street side of the building and the scale there, which is being proposed uh, along Ellery Street uh, on that north to south corridor. Um, also wanted to point out that we've got an elevated ground floor here, which is taking the building up out of uh, harm's way from flood elevation. Um, uh, and that's storm, uh, storm surge as well as um, uh, uh, sea level rise. Um, we also wanted to, to point out that uh, in this section, um, on the right-hand side of this, the kind of light blue color of the building, this is our mid-rise portion. This is where our 94 units of senior affordable housing are going to be. Uh, to the left-hand side on Ellery Street is our residential tower, which is uh, made up of market rate units. Um, we do have a number of shared uh, amenities. In fact, most of the amenities in the building are shared between both of these. We always we see this as one building, one community in many ways. Um, and, uh, and, and wanted to kind of point out that um, you know, the, the building will kind of operate as one here. Next slide. So uh, a couple other points relative to the context here. We've got four very different sides of this. We just talked about the .av context in Ellery Street, but to the south of us, which is uh, plan left here, uh, we have what we're calling our east open space, one of two uh, major open spaces uh, in the nine acre plan. Um, our building uh, faces that we have um, lots of active uses uh, along the ground floor retail at the corner of uh, Dot Ave and the east open space, as well as more retail along Ellery Street in the east open space. We have our senior uh, um, affordable lobby uh, at the north 
east corner of the building. This also happens to be the lowest point where Dorchester Ave is at its lowest and in, in intersects with Alger, um, which actually gives us a, a nice raised um, uh, condition at that lobby. We have an outdoor porch there. We're calling our seniors porch where we expect there to be uh, rocking chairs and Adirondack chairs looking out over Dot Ave. Uh, our residential um, tower lobby is, uh, is on Ellery Street, and then we have a number of um, artist lofts and a gallery uh, along Ellery as well. Part of Alger is, is dedicated to serving the building, so our parking ramp, our loading dock, and other back of house spaces. Next. So this is a view from the uh, from the southeast looking to the northwest. Uh, you can see our mid-rise senior affordable housing kind of right up front and present on Dorchester Avenue. Uh, you can see uh, a little bit in this how we've raised uh, the, the kind of front porch level uh, and ground floor level of this again for resi resiliency purposes. And then on the uh, other side, um, uh, behind the senior uh, housing, we have our, uh, mar our, our market rate uh, residential tower. To the left in this is our east open space. Um, and you can see how some of our, our building is addressing that in, in all kinds of active ways. Next. This is a view from the southwest looking to the northeast uh, along uh, Ellery Street. Um, so you can see how we've created a tower here that creates a real focal point at a bend in the road at Ellery. You can also see uh, the relationship between the tower and the mid-rise and also then to the, um, to the east open space as well. Next slide. This is a view along, uh, looking north along Dorchester Avenue, again showing you the, 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 the uh, ground level activated retail. Um, uh, a little bit further down, dot up here on the left hand side is our senior porch um, and uh, trying to create a, a condition here which is going to be active. Um, we have a, um, a, a sloped walkway up to that, that level, um, which, which creates a nice gracious way for people to, to access that, that slightly raised level. We, we sort of call it our high road and low road and uh, we think that it, it's a kind of great uh, parallel kind of circulation route that's accessible in all places for uh, for Dorchester Avenue next slide uh, and then this is our the southern edge of our building uh, which faces onto that east open space um, you can see starting from the left we've got uh, um, retail here we think it's gonna this is gonna be sort of cafe coffee bakery kind of retail um, uh, at the far right we have what will be food and beverage with outdoor dining looking out over the east open space and then between the two we have a, a publicly accessible interactive um, performance stage uh, which is intended to uh, allow the building to interact um, in a very meaningful way to the open space to, to the south. Next slide. Thank you, Michael. So I want to just to point out uh, two or three of the most critical community benefits in our mind. As you can see, there's, there's a list of them, and we've had an extensive engagement with the community. I think most important and often overlooked, this is a federally regulated former metal scrapyard location. It is one of the top three or four most hazardous sites in the city of Boston. It's currently capped and, and stabilized, but this project will begin the process of remediating and removing that hazardous material from the site, safety and increasing the safety and obviously the environmental sustainability of the location. There are 94 units of serviced enriched, income restricted senior housing uh, being developed as part of a 331 unit transit oriented residential building uh, in a neat part of the neighborhood that really needs activation, lighting, new sidewalks, and safety and security to stabilize this part of the neighborhood. And so uh, we look forward to bringing this residential project forward. And, and I want to ask John Barrows, the joint venture partner involved in that residential component, to do our conclusion for us. And Mark, I was going to just introduce uh, John, because I didn't right. mention him at the beginning. But um, one of the exciting parts of this project is that we've already selected a, a JV partner, and I've known John and Greg Minot for a long time, so we thought we'd invite John to uh, close out our presentation tonight. And on behalf of the core uh, team and principals, David Pogorals, thank you again for uh, the ability. So John, it's all yours. Thank you, John. I just wanted to uh, uh, join and say thank you for to, uh, um, the VPDA staff, uh, Director Jameson, for your guidance and leadership um, for uh, BCDC. This is an exciting project. We're excited to bring the 94 units of, of independent affordable housing that's going to be supported by programming and services. 
But the only way we could do that is in partnership with the city and state, and it's been a tremendous uh, process so far, and we look forward to working with you to continue to uh, move this project forward. Thank you. Okay, great. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, it does. Thank you, ma'am. That's concluding slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great. Uh, so this is a public hearing. So before we take questioning from the board members, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a public comment. So, Secretary Polhemus, do we have anyone who would like to testify? Patty McCormick, you can unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Thank you all. This is Patty McCormick, Andrew Square resident and vice president of the Andrew Square Civic Association. And I'm also speaking on behalf of Linda Zabrocki, who had to leave to catch the train to work. Uh, she's president of the Andrew Square Civic. Uh, we are both IOG members and share the same sentiments. Andrew Square residents have waited patiently for this re revitalization of Dorchester Ave for many years, as we truly believe it will be part of the change needed to become a safe, healthy, and vibrant neighborhood. 495 Dorchester Ave, also known as on the dot, will be that con will be the cornerstone for that trans transformation. It has been a long journey, and recently we have seen a snippet of what is possible with the law. Grateful to David Pogorel, John Sissel, and the core team for their investment in our neighborhood and eager to get shovels in the ground. And we'd also like to thank the many folks at BPDA that we've worked with over the years to get us to this point. And I just go on record in full support of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Shatan Green, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shatan Green. I was born and raised in Boston. Um, I'm a proud lifelong resident. I'm also the business agent for the Greater Boston Building Trade Unions. I first want to say thank you to the BBTA for facilitating these important public meetings and also to say thank you for listening to the community voice. I want to thank Core Investments um, as they continue. Um, I want to say thank you to Core Investments for their commitment to the building trades in Boston. We understand the hard work and planning and dedication that goes into making this a great project. Um, and I'm just happy that the highest worker, community, environmental standards um, are going to be met, um, providing great careers, great homes for, uh, for residents that live in the city. So um, I support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Shatan. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Minor Perez representing the Carpenters Union. I'd like to go in record and free, um, and strong support of this project. And I definitely have to say kudos to uh, Mr. Cicero for a great, him and his team for great outreach to the community. And definitely a great project uh, for everybody. And uh, I also like to thank the Office of Mayor Wolf for allowing the community to be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Minor. If anybody else would like to testify, please raise your virtual hand. Madam Chair, this concludes the public hearing portion of this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you to uh, those members of the public that participated. Uh, okay, questions or comments from the board? Uh, through the chair, I'd like to ask, is there a timeline for shovels in the ground if this was to be approved today? And uh, also, have you selected a general contractor for this project? I'd be happy to take those questions. First of all, we've been working with uh, a general contractor, Lee Kennedy, in the pre-development and pre-construction part of the project. We, we anticipate uh, keeping Lee Kennedy on board for the project. 495. In regards uh, to the timeline, we'd love to start digging tomorrow. We still have some other things to work on with the EPA on finalizing our wrap and uh, on the regulation side of that. That that has been ongoing and, and should be hopefully happening later this uh, this summer. And if all goes well, one of the first steps would be remediation. As uh, as Mark highlighted, this is a severely polluted site and, and before we even begin construction we're going to do what we're calling a TOSCA enabling part of the project which would be to begin 
um, environmental remediation, and we're hoping that could be this year. And if that goes well, and according to plan, then we'll be looking at a, a vertical start to the project in sometime in 25 uh, is, our, is our aspirational goal here tonight. Okay. Any other any additional questions or comments? Um, well, I'd just like to say I, I, I love this project. I am very excited for that senior porch. <laughs> I love a rocking chair and Adirondack, but um, you know, I think that senior porch is um, I don't know, I, I think is a has always been part of a goal, right? For uh, I think for uh, for me and how I saw elder uh, elder people in our in my community um, to you know like they were just on the porch <laughs> and and uh, just played in that um, played a part in that kind of the village raising. <laughs> Uh, the, the children and uh, I that imagery was just really uh, really stood out to me um, and I'm glad that um, that has been incorporated um, because it's you know it's more than just a porch um, so yeah uh, I think that was my my only comment but um, with that a motion is order so moved Second. roll call for a vote Miss Bennett Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, congratulations. Good luck. Thank you. And thank you thank for all you. that remediation that you're going to do. That's That means a lot. Thank you. Good night now. Good Bye. night. All right. I, uh, let's go to the next agenda item. Is it a public hearing? Item number 30. Okay. Uh, and thanks to interpreters who helped with that last, uh, that last item. So uh, this as well will have interpretation. So simultaneous, simultaneous Cantonese and Mandarin interpretations uh, are being provided for this meeting using the language interpretation function within Zoom. We ask that you be patient in case of any technical issues. Language interpretation will not be enabled until instructions on how to access interpretation have been translated. Uh, once interpretation has been enabled, the globe icon will appear on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, an important reminder to all those who are presenting and commenting today. Uh, we ask that you speak slowly for the interpreters. If you're speaking too fast, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak slower so that the translators can catch up with the information. So thank you. Uh, to enable interpretation service for, uh, for Cantonese and Mandarin, uh, please click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and select the language you want to hear. Uh, you must also mute original audio. So, Anna, will you please now interpret the instructions that I gave into Cantonese? Certainly. Thank you much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna. I'll be a Cantonese interpreter for the meeting tonight.大家好，我系李，我系李弟弟。家大哥，同声翻译广东话，诶嘅翻译嘅。而家见到个地球嘅时候咧，揿落去拣广东话就会讲广东话嘅频道啦。用手机或者平板电脑嘅话
If you are having difficulty activating the interpretation, please call the phone number on the screen. If you have difficulties with the translation later in the meeting, you can also call that same number. We have interpreters available to assist you over the phone. The project presentation has been translated into Cantonese and Mandarin and is available on the BPDA website at bostonplans.org slash about dash us slash BPDA dash board slash board dash meetings. Please take note of the website address on the screen to view the translated project presentation. Secretary Pulhemus, I'm just taking a pause to check that the uh, interpretation channels are good to go. They're good to go. Thank you. Uh, okay, this is the public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Being held in conformance with Articles 80B and 80C of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed project at 103 North Beacon Street in Alston. This hearing was duly advertised on January 6, 2024 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to the questioning, subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time, so if you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active and click on the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must Unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain, and at that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. Uh, Mr. Valship, will, uh, will you now please begin the presentation? Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Polimus, and Director Jemison. The proposal before you is for an Article 80 large project known as the 103 North Beacon Street project in the Brighton neighborhood and an associated PDA development plan for what will become plan development area number 149. The proposed project is for a mixed use building containing approximately 245,000 square feet of gross floor area that includes ground floor retail space and core shell lab ready space in the remainder of the building. The project includes parking for up to 196 vehicles and will be designed to at least lead gold standards. The project will construct uh, low stress bike lanes along Arthur Street and North Beacon Street to link into the broader community network. The proponents provide a $75,000 contribution to support upcoming work at nearby Ringer Park. The BPDA held a virtual IAG meeting for this project on June 14th, 2023, a virtual public meeting on June 7th, 2023, and a joint IAG and public meeting on January 3rd, 2024. All meetings were well attended, and the public meetings were advertised in local newspaper and online. I want to thank the BPDA staff, IAG members, and members of the public who contributed their time and efforts to improving this project through the course of our review. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Ben Zunkler, from the BPDA Zoning Compliance Team to discuss the planning context that was considered in the review of this project before the development team begins their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Ben Zunkler, and I'm a senior planner in the planning department, here before you to present the planning context. The proposed project, governed by Article 51, as Quinn mentioned, is PDA eligible and falls within the Guest Street Local Industrial Zoning Subdistrict and the Brighton Guest Street Planning Study and Urban Design Guidelines adopted by the board in 2012. Additionally, the proposed project respects two neighborhood-wide planning studies the Alston Brighton Mobility Plan adopted by the board in 2021, and the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, Alston Brighton Arts, Culture, and Placekeeping Report. While the Boston Zoning Code hasn't been updated to reflect these recommendations, BBDA staff considered zoning, the Brighton Guest Street Study, and several other resources in our review of this project. Next slide, please. The Brighton Guest Street study envisions a vibrant, mixed-use district with a significant gateway at Arthur Street. 
Staff review ensured compliance with mobility goals, complete street design guidelines, the Boston Transportation Department's North Beacon Street low stress bike lane, and the development of a new gateway for the emerging district. During the review, vehicular access to the site was consolidated, best practice streetscape design was followed, and conflicts between modes minimized for safety and comfort. Next slide, please. Staff review focused on the building design, accessible routes, long-term health of the street plantings, and sustainability goals. The proposed building steps back along the North Beacon Street edge, reflecting the urban design intent of the Brighton Guest Street study. The proposal is also compliant with the Boston Complete Street guidelines and green building and resilience measures. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the board after the presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kim Tai. I'm a director of development at IQHQ, and I wanted to say thank you, and we're very excited to be here to be presenting our project at 103 North Beacon Street. Um, first off, I just wanted to say thank you to BPDA staff and the mayor's office for their continued collaboration during this process. And in addition, thank you to Leader Moran, Rep Honan, and Councillor Brayden's office for their continued support and input with respect to community benefits. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Phil Casey uh, to present our project. Great, thanks, Kim, and good evening, everybody. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. I'm not sure who's perfect. So we'll start with a neighborhood image here. Just to give you a sense of the project in its context, you can see 103 North Beacon uh, in the orange in the foreground at the corner of North Beacon Street and Arthur Street. And then behind it, you start to see the the Guest Street Development Corridor, the significant height and density that's aligned up against the highway, really upwards of almost 200 feet there. And then as we move south towards our site, the ability of 103 North Beacon uh, stepping down to 92 feet in the height, really mitigating that scale between the taller commercial district and then that more granular residential district in the neighborhood, just to the south of the street. Um, also interesting enough, you'll see here, you know, I think as Ben mentioned earlier, the idea of the Arthur Street Gateway, this new pedestrian connector into this new district that Alston Yards has created, as well back to the Boston Landing Transit uh, Commuter Rail Station. So the idea of how this project in, in its public realm can really play an important role as a gateway to encourage that you know, community access, that pedestrian circulation from the community through the site as well to the commuter, commuter rail transit station. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then the overall project itself. So it's a six-story uh, life science building, 246,000 square feet, uh, 198 parking spaces below grade. And as mentioned before, you start to see that stepping form down to North Beacon Street. The idea of mitigating the scale, both of the building form and its architecture, the idea of um, activated terraces, also a setback on Arthur Street as well. Um, here you can see the 92 feet overall building zoning height for the highest occupied floor. And then the step up to 122 feet for the mechanical, life science mechanical penthouse. But that penthouse is also set back and layered into the architecture, um, really respecting the BPDA guidelines for mechanical penthouses, trying to minimize that visual impact, uh, as well as you can see the main entrance to the building on Arthur Street here, along that sort of pedestrian concourse. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, a little bit on the compliance with the BPA Life Science Penthouse Guidelines. The idea that it's volumetric, but really setting that volume back. Again, from a pedestrian sidewalk perspective, what the community experiences, setting back those sight lines, and really minimizing um, the visual heft of those, uh, that building and in, in being in compliance with those guidelines as well. Next slide. Uh, and then to the ground plan, a little bit, you can see Arthur Street here at the bottom of the page. Uh, the main building lobby and entrance of that larger area, arrow right in the middle of Arthur Street. And then you start to see really the active edges all along North Beacon Street. The idea of this will be retail, uh, publicly programmed amenity space that will spill out onto the sidewalk potentially all along Arthur Street as well as turning the corner down to Hitchport Street. So the idea of um, creating very active edges along that public realm and facilitating that pedestrian passageway. Um, from a public realm standpoint, if you look at the corner of North Beacon Street and Herrick Street, you look at it's almost a 23-foot dimension from the edge of the building to the curb. So they have a very generous proportion that allows not only for a green buffer, reintroducing that sort of street trees and green buffer along North Beacon Street, 
uh, as well as a, a 10 foot wide, very clear pedestrian circulation zone. Again, facilitating that pedestrian movement around the corner, Arthur Street, that gateway into the new development as well as the Boston site. Um, as you turn the corner, similarly in Arthur Street, um, a 15 foot dimension, very generous between the building and the site, a very clear pedestrian path um, at the building lobby. You start to see that relief and that expansion of the public realm. And then as you move farther north or page right, um, down again towards the Boston Boston building developments, we have almost a 30 foot dimension. So the idea of those public active edges having spill out spaces, whether it's cafe seating, sidewalk, et cetera, again, to activate those edges. Um, also along Hitchborn Street, as well as Herrick Street, we're able to bring uh, street trees and line that edge uh, on both those public faces. And then um, finally, service and loading was consolidated into one curb cut off of Herrick Street, uh, minimizing some of those transportation conflicts and really the impact overall of the public realm. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then just some site sections, again, giving you a sense of those proportions. That top section is really, you can see North Beacon Street up to the face of the building. There's that 23-foot uh, dimension to the curb. Again, that planting edge, bringing that greenery to North Beacon Street, um, a 10-foot, very clear pedestrian passage, but then also that dimension allowing for that retail spillage uh, out onto the street and activating that edge, cafe seating and whatnot as part of that. Uh, similarly, the section below that on Arthur Street, again, facilitating that very clear pedestrian circulation along the sidewalk against the building with that green edge. Um, and then Herrick Street uh, and Hitchborn being a very similar, a smaller scale uh, sidewalk in public realm, but still bringing street trees and green um, really all the way around the site. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, some just some 3D imagery to give everybody a sense of the scale and the experience. This is an image looking east down North Beacon Street as you approach the building, you start to understand that human scale. There's that green buffer, that very generous proportion of the sidewalk. You start to see canopies for various retail and entries, um, really starting to activate those edges to draw the community in and down to the Arthur Street. Next image, please. Uh, and next slide. Thank you. Oh, uh, maybe go back one, apologies. Uh, and then another, this is another image looking at East End. Beacon Street, but the idea of very much that generous proportion. You see here the idea of spill out cafe seating. So that proportion allows that, um, all those sort of uses to happen in that public realm, we feel it is a good way to facilitate that gateway aspect of it. Um, next slide, please. And then as we turn the corner, this is looking north down Arthur Street again towards the Alston Landing developments in the distance. You start to see where the 103 is, that's the building lobby entrance. Very active retail frontage, peppered with different entries, different uh, canopies, bringing that scale much, much more down to a human scale along that sidewalk edge, and then maintaining that green strip, um, as you can see along the bike between that building. Next slide. And then this is a view looking across Arthur Street, really at the building entry. This is the lobby here, giving that identity and presence mid-block to the, to the project, but also bringing some relief to that public realm with that inset in. A lot of eyes on the street. You can see on either side of the building lobby, those colors there, the idea of that active retail edge still bringing a lot of vitality to that street um, as people are progressing back and forth along it. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, looking at the public realm back towards North Beacon Street uh, along Arthur, um, you can start to see really that generous proportion, almost a 30-foot sidewalk dimension, the idea of whether that's building amenity space or retail space, those spilling out, allowing that pedestrian circulation very clearly defined, but also these separate sort of cafe seating area, these sort of discrete areas um, for the public to stop. It's kind of moments of respite um, that are part of the public realm. And then the opportunity to really green up the public realm there with that generous proportion uh, to integrate that into the master planning aspects. Uh, next slide, please. And then a further view here, looking back down Arthur Street towards North Beacon, you can see the building steps back at the third floor, sort of minimizing it. Um, you also get a sense of the, the building architecture here, the idea of um, the architectural language really building off the industrial history and character of the neighborhood with these oversized window frames and these black and metal frames and the rigor of that repetition of a low, long kind of industrial building. Um, again, the building entry in the mid-block and then a very active street edge 
um, along the ground floor, you can see turning that corner down Hitchborn as well. So really activating three sides of that building very effectively. Next slide, please. And then finally, just again, an image of the building looking across North Beacon Street. Again, incorporating all those sort of elements from the, the step down to North Beacon Street, the idea of integrating, a, layering that building mechanical penthouse to minimize those visual sight lines. And then those very active ground floor retail features. Um, that's our presentation, and I'm happy to take your comments and feedback. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as a public hearing, we'll first start with the public testimony. Uh, Secretary Polkemus, do we have anyone who would like to testify? Mimi Clement, you can unmute yourself. Mimi, if you're having difficulty, you can call 617-918-4254. Mimi. Oh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I am a Alston resident. Um, I live about 10 minutes from the, the site. Um, I'm extremely excited about the, the project. Um, my only recommendation is if, if by any chance if you could uh, Hold on a sec. Oh, my only recommendation um, is if you could add more bike racks. There's a lot of students that live here, and it would probably be great to just encourage uh, more biking, especially with the, the bike lanes. Um, but overall, I really love the project and the green space. There aren't a lot of green space in Alston, so I really, really appreciate this. Thank you, Mimi. John Cusack, you can unmute yourself. Uh, good, uh, good, I guess good evening. Uh, my name is John Cusack. I'm a resident of 186 Washington Street in Brighton. Uh, I've attended uh, the IAGs as a member of the public and attended the public meetings. I think they've done a lot to sort of come to this point of the design, and I'm very much in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher Drahir, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I know it sounds um, kind of uh, maybe, just being quick and specific, uh, unpopular to be against this, but um, it's in Chinese now. Um, sorry, um, or Mandarin. Oh, but I um, I'm actually very much against this project because um, for a few reasons. One, I, I just don't see the need for another life science building at all. Actually, there are so many other upper places within the Boston area where this. Um, I assume there's a potential viable tenant for the um, IQH and Keynes building contractor company to literally suffice for tenancy. I mean, I, I'm to be completely clear, there are other aspects and uses for 300,000 square feet for the city that are of much greater need and importance than a bunch more biotechnicians. I mean, from my own perspective, I don't even think the United States should be even using any biotechnology whatsoever, but that's something separate. But I, I don't think biology is a technology, but number one. Number two, um, if you are going to go that route, why don't you just do hydroponic urban agriculture like within that building? So you can actually, sorry, 30 seconds. Um, so like, literally you can just grow like, a fair amount of the city's food in that space with that just that building. Another aspect is you can actually literally house most of the Boston's homeless in that building. And I mean, at some point, the city is going to have to start putting forth viable 
needs and solutions like actual equitable needs for their citizens that are actually pertinent and purposeful like i'm sorry but there's no purpose for a biotechnician company to even exist let alone work in boston sorry thank thanks thank you dan daly you can unmute yourself thank you can you hear me yes we can hear you uh, Thank you, Madam Sec Secretary and the BPDA Board. Uh, my name is Daniel Daly. I'm a lifelong Alston Brighton resident. I'm also a, a member of the IAG for this project. Uh, I'd like to thank the developer for uh, listening and working with our impact advisory group and the neighborhood in general. Um, they've created uh, some lab space at Brighton High School, part of a Brighton partnership, and also uh, committed to uh, rebuilding our, our lost music rehearsal space on uh, North Beacon Street. So I want to uh, just throw my support behind this project and uh, I think it's a great moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Chair, members of the board, this is Minor Perez representing Congress Union Carpenters and Liberal Work for the City of Boston. We'd like to go on record and strong support of this project. Kudos to the proponent for great community outreach and um, great for the great community uh, benefit package that was put together and keeping uh, the residents in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minor. Nick Block, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Block. Um, I'm a Brighton resident. Um, I'm also a member of the Brighton Alston Improvement Association. Um, and I would like to go on record in support of this project. Um, I think that um, the proponents have really been good about engaging the community and supporting our local schools. Thank you. Thank you. Shaitan Green, you can unmute yourself. Hello, um, my name is Shaitan Green. I'm a Boston resident. I'm also the business agent for the Boston Building Trades Unions. Um, I want to thank the BPTA for facilitating these employee meetings and, and for listening to the community, the community voice. I also uh, want to thank uh, Dave Sorrett and Kim Tai at, at an IQ, IQHQ as they continue to go above and beyond for Boston. We understand that the hard work and planning and dedication that, that makes this a great project and uh, every step has been taken. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, the careers that will be um, built on this job um, will ensure that the highest, highest worker standards are met along with community environmental uh, standards as well. So, um, and we know that by, by upholding those high standards um, helps the community thrive and the city thrive in so many ways. So I'd like to say thank you. And I'd like to say that uh, as the building trades, we support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Annabella Gomes, you can unmute yourself. Thanks. My name is Annabella Gomes, resident and IAG member for this project. I'd like to go on record and support the developer has really worked with the community and the IAG um, in coming up with a plan that really works with the, the community and has a great public realm for the community. So I'd like to go on record and support. Thank you. Thanks, Annabella. Hong Goon, you can unmute yourself. Yes, good evening, manager and the board. Uh, I live in Austin, Upper North Austin, and I want to be on the record to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. James Clark, you can unmute yourself. Uh, <clears throat> hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is James Clark. Uh, I live on Saunders Street in Brighton, um, and I have for over 20 years, so I'm about 100 yards from this project. I'd like to go on the record in support of this project. Um, I also appreciate the thoughtful approach IQHQ has demonstrated both with the projects they've advanced and working with our neighbors. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Would anybody else like to testify about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. Madam Chair, this concludes the public hearing portion of this item. Okay, great. Uh, let's go to uh, questions or comments from the board. Okay, I do um, have a couple questions. Um, 
around the building use. So, uh, and in coming off of some of the um, some of the themes raised in uh, in letters and, and in emails and people who testified today. So, um, have you identified uh, a tenant yet for uh, for this building? Um, and kind of, can you speak to? You know a little bit about your market research and decision making um, kind of rationale, right? To six to select and stay with um, lab use uh, for this um, for this parcel. Um, you know, I'm just trying to kind of connect some of the you know stories that we see in our local publications on um, on the saturation of of lab buildings and and you know just wanted to get kind of what. Um, get your take on it <laughs> and um, you know that's you know you believe in it enough to make this kind of significant investment for that use so hopefully that generally makes a little bit of sense yes it does chairwoman um, and thank you for the question so I think uh, to answer your first question um, IQ HQ is a life sciences rate and what we build our core and shell building. So typically a tenant is not determined until about a year before our CFO or certificate of occupancy. However, I think our background might be helpful in answering your question about you know, what we're doing and why we still believe in life sciences. Um, so IQHQ was founded about a little over three years ago uh, with the same founders of Alexandria and Biomed and so we have over 35 years of experience in the life sciences and development world and industry. Um, our co-CEO is also a, um, has a leasing background uh, with Kilroy for again, many years. So there's a lot of experience within our company ourselves and then we always select the best vendors to be able to market um, all of our um, projects and yes we do have a number of projects but again we are building class a life sciences suites um, in addition to that if you noticed uh, this is a mixed-use building so it will be primarily life science however there is a retail component um, so we do want to make sure that there are other amenities and uses that can actively support the tenants that are within the building and the community in the neighborhood so while you know I you know you see headlines that there's a cooling off period we're still very, very confident that we'll be able to move forward and occupy these buildings. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, thank you very much, congratulations, and, and good luck. Thank you very much. For you. Okay. Let's go to the next item is another public hearing, our third. Sorry, I'm just scrolling here. Um, okay, item number 31. Uh, so I'm going to be recusing uh, myself from this. Thank you, Dr. Landsmark. Um, so, duly noted for the record. Um, Agenda item number 31. This will also have um, simulta simultaneous interpretation services for <clears throat> Mandarin, Cantonese, and Spanish. Uh, uh, interpretations are being provided for this meeting using the language interpretation function within Zoom. We ask that you be patient in case of any technical issues. Language interpretation will not be enabled until instructions on how to access interpretation have been translated. Once interpretation has been enabled, a globe icon will appear at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, an important reminder to all who are presenting and commenting today, we ask that you speak slowly for the interpreter. If you're speaking too fast, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak slower so the translator can catch up with the information. Uh, so thank you in advance. To enable interpretation services for Spanish, Mandarin, or Cantonese, click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and select the language you wish to hear. Also, you must uh, mute original audio. So let's start with Spanish. Juan, will you now please inter interpret the instructions I just gave into Spanish? Uh, 
Certainly, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is one, one of the Spanish interpreters. I will provide the interpretation in Spanish, how to access the interpretation feature. Muy buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal, uno de los intérpretes asignado a la reunión de hoy. El servicio de interpretación simultánea en español está siendo ofrecido en esta reunión utilizando las funciones de interpretación de Zoom. Por favor, sea paciente en caso de que se presente algún problema técnico. El icono de la interpretación no va a ser habilitado hasta que se interpreten todas las instrucciones en español. Una vez habilitada la función de interpretación, un icono como un globo aparecerá en la parte inferior derecha de sus pantallas. También es importante recordarle a todos aquellos que estén presentando que hay que hablar despacio para poder asistir a los intérpretes en su interpretación. Es posible que se tenga que interrumpir a aquella persona que esté hablando demasiado rápido para asistir a los intérpretes. Para habilitar la función en español, haga un clic, por favor, en el ícono del globo en la parte inferior derecha de sus pantallas. Gracias, bienvenidos. Back to you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, now, Terry, will you please interpret the instructions I just gave into Mandarin? Certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 大家好, 我叫Terry, 我是今天的国语的频道。那我和我的同事呢，会给大家做这个国语的频道呃翻译哈。待会儿在屏幕下方看到一个地球的图标，然后您点选地球的图标，然后再选择Mandarin普通话，您就可以听到国语的频道了。
When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. EPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain, and at that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. And Quinn, uh, will you now please begin the presentation? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Palimus and Director Jemison. The proposal before you is for an Article 80 large project known as the Belvedere Street Student Housing Project and an associated PDA amendment to Plan Development Area Number 37, the Prudential Center Redevelopment. The project is located at 39 Dalton Street in the Back Bay. The proposed project is for an interior renovation of the approximately 250,000 square foot south tower of the Sheridan Hotel and change of use to allow dorm use within this PDA. The proposed renovation of the South Tower will convert the existing 428 rooms to approximately 856 student beds, along with approximately 18,000 square feet of student, student amenity space and a renovated publicly accessible outdoor plaza. The project will also contribute $256,000 to the City of Boston for proposed pedestrian and roadway improvements along Belvedere Street and Dalton Street, including the addition of bike lanes and the alterations to the curb regulation in the area to facilitate better pick up and drop off in this busy corridor. The associated Sixth Amendment to PDA number 37 proposes to allow dormitory use within this PDA. The dormitory use will be permitted only so long as it is also identified and approved in a corresponding institutional master plan. Further, it is permitted for an initial 10-year term with an option to extend by an additional 10 years at the BPA's discretion. The initial 10-year term is anticipated to be reflected within the Northeastern University Institutional Master Plan and will be added to that document by a cur currently pending IMP amendment. This will allow the BPA and the City of Boston to monitor the use for the initial 10-year period and reassess its viability at the end of this term. Northeastern University is just beginning to engage with the BPDA on their next 10-year institutional master plan, anticipated to cover a term from 2024 to 2034. This public process will allow for extensive master planning, including a full analysis of the university's footprint within the City of Boston and any anticipated growth. We look forward to being back in front of the board to present this upcoming 10-year plan in the near future. The BPDA held a virtual IAG meeting for this project on August 30th, 2023, and a virtual public meeting on September 21st, 2023. Both meetings were well attended, and the public meeting was advertised in the local newspaper and online. I want to thank the BPDA staff, IAG members, and members of the public who contributed their time and efforts to improving this project through the course of our review. I also wanted to note that we've received support for this project from Councillor Ed Flynn, Councillor Sharon Durkin, uh, at large Councillor Murphy, and we received a letter of support from former at large city councillor Flaherty during his time in office while the project was under review. We've also received support from the Carpenters and Hotel Unions and a notice of non opposition from the Neighbor Association of the Back Bay. I also wanted to thank Councillor Durkin and Kevin from Councillor Murphy's office for their thoughtful testimony in support of this project earlier in the meeting. I'll now hand it over to my colleague, uh, Ted Schwartzberg from the BPA zoning compliance team to discuss the planning context considered in the review of this project before the development team begin their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, I will now present two slides on the planning and zoning context that BPDA staff considered in their review of this proposal. The zoning for this site is governed by PDA number 37 for the Prudential Center. And then in addition to that PDA overlay, it's governed by the underlying zoner art, zoning article for this part of Back Bay, Article 41. Uh, the planning context that was most relevant was the Housing Boston 2030 study. And then the site context that was most relevant is that this is an existing hotel within the Prudential Center complex and it is immediately adjacent to a Green Line station. Next slide, next slide please. In terms of compliance with the zoning, uh, the PDA overlay uh, is being requested to be amended, and in the underlying zo zoning, Article 41, uh, uh, dormitory is a conditional use. 
Uh, in addition to use, staff consider dimensions. Uh, dimensions have no effective change since this is an adaptation of the existing building with no change to the building dimensions. The reason why staff recommended this use for being to be appropriate where it's zoned conditional is that the proposed allocation of new off student housing in a hotel is very well aligned with the city's wide housing citywide housing goals outlined in housing boston 2030 and the planning staff would also like to recognize the proponent team for working to comply with the bike parking guidelines for institutional housing which were particularly challenging given the constraints that were presented by the adaptive reuse of this existing hotel building. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, BPDA board, for the opportunity to present today. Uh, my name is Karin Suri, uh, co-founder, managing general partner of Hawkins Way Capital, uh, the project proponent. Uh, I wanted to start by first thanking BPDA staff, uh, especially Quinn and McCour, who have been immensely helpful in working with us to bring this application uh, to this point. We are truly grateful for all your efforts. Uh, also, thank you to the BPDA design staff for all their constructive inputs to the project. I would like to start our presentation uh, today by giving a brief overview of our firm and our proposed project. Uh, Hawkins Way Capital is a private real estate investment firm focused on the revitalization and repurposing of underutilized and out of favor real estate assets in urban core cities. Since our inception, we have acquired, repositioned, and owned properties in major gateway cities, including New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Boston. The Boston Sheraton Hotel was acquired by Hawkins Way in February 2022, and it is our fourth project in the city. In addition to the Boston Sheraton, our firm owns and operates two other hotels in Boston, which were both underperforming in aging properties in need of renovations when we acquired them. The first is the Copley Square Hotel, located at 47 Huntington Avenue, which we acquired in 2019 and proceeded to upgrade the rooms, common areas, and FB facilities. This property is currently owned and operated by our firm and serves as one of the best performing independent branded hotels catering to the convention center hotel business. The second hotel is located at 70 Charles Street South, which is also currently owned and operated by our firm under the Found Hotel brand. Hospitality assets in urban core cities have evolved significantly in the last few years. In order for older hotels to stay competitive with newer developments, they require significant capital improvements and often need to be right-sized to stay competitive. When we acquired the Sheraton Boston, it was quite old and tired and in need of an upgrade. And it was also too big in terms of hotel room count when compared to its peers. Therefore, it wasn't performing to its full potential. In order to prevent a scenario where the hotel would have been shut down permanently because it wasn't economically viable, Hawkins Way acquired the hotel, which has two towers, with the business plan of splitting the hotel into two distinct properties and keeping one as a hotel but making it into a new modernized Sheraton Hotel, and the second tower would be converted to an alternative use. By changing the use of one of the towers, the unit count for the hotel could be reduced to make it more competitive and financially profitable. It is important to note that Hawkins Way has never proposed converting both towers from hotel to alternative uses. To appreciate today's proposal, the full picture of our plans for both towers should be evaluated together. Next, as part of our plan, both towers would undergo significant capital improvements that have been needed for many years. The larger hotel tower will be undergoing a substantial upgrade in the coming months, whereby all the rooms and common areas of the hotel will be renovated to the standards of a brand new Sheraton Hotel. This renovation, which is very much needed, will allow the Sheraton Hotel to become, in our opinion, the premier flagship hotel for the, combine, for the Heinz Convention Center area for years to come. It is important to note that all of the convention area and common areas that are part of the Sheraton Hotel today will continue to be part of the hotel going forward, and our plans don't call for the removal of any common areas. We hope that this substantial investment into the Sheraton Hotel, along with our ownership of two other hotels in Boston, is a very clear testament of Hawking Way's firm commitment to the hospitality industry here in Boston and the convention business, which is so important to the surrounding community. 
As for the second tower, which we're proposing to convert, over the course of the last four years, Northeastern students have been occupying the tower under a temporary order that was passed during the pandemic. This use, while initially unplanned, has turned out to be great for the community since it allows many students to reside in one area rather than being dispersed throughout the surrounding residential neighborhoods, which makes monitoring students and their activities much more challenging. In addition, and more importantly, by providing these much needed student residential beds, this will remove more than 800 students from the immediately surrounding residential leasing market, which will further help preserve affordable housing for residents in need and immediately would, have, would add new housing supply to an extremely supply-constrained housing market here in Boston, which all goes towards helping housing affordability. Our proposal here today seeks to make what was originally a temporary use that has proven to be very successful into a permanent use, and this will also allow us to make much needed fire life safety improvements to the tower that are more conducive to student housing. The result will be a safer and more viable student residences for many years to come. We thank you again for your time and consideration for our proposal. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Kathy Spiegelman, Vice President of Planning, Real Estate, and Facilities at Northeastern University. Well, thank you, Karen. And thank you, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Chief Jemison. Um, a lot has already been said uh, about the project and about uh, Northeastern's role in it. We're extremely um, happy uh, to be able to support the PDA amendment that would allow a situation that has been in place for the past several years, started by a reaction to COVID and a desire to try and find appropriate places for students um, to occupy housing that didn't have negative impacts in the community. Uh, John Tobin and our Office of City and Community Affairs and representatives of our resident life staff have met with community groups and elected officials several times during our occupancy in the past several years and several times since Hawkins purchased the building uh, with the intention to have the North Tower renovated as Karen just described. Some of our students move in in the fall and some move in in January so and so we take very seriously uh, the arrangements for move-in which we do over several days in order to prevent any kind of impacts on the streets um, all of the moving will happen from the loading dock and through the garage. Um, it is issues like that that uh, by, as Karen suggested, concentrating housing in this location in a formerly ho former hotel structure um, allows us to house our students, manage their behavior, their comings and goings in a way that uh, allows us to be a good neighbor. Um, we are, as an anchor tenant, we have agreed to add the property to our institutional master plan. We plan to occupy for a period of 10 years with the option to renew for another 10 years. Um, and we also are engaged in man maintaining the property. So um, with having uh, 800 plus students living in the building, we have a responsibility with our partner Hawkins to make sure that the property remains in very good shape and a contributor to the Prudential Center commercial area. We are very pleased to be here tonight uh, and able to add to the supply of student housing consistent with the city's uh, housing plan uh, over the next several years. Uh, and we want to thank the BPDA staff for supporting the amendment and for allowing us to be part of taking a declining building asset and enabling it to address this important city objective for more student housing. Thank you. Next slide. I'm Julie Reeker from Gensler, the architect, and we'll take through, go through a few slides here to sh remind us where the project location is and its proximity to many things within the community. Next slide. This further shows its location within the Prudential Superblock with the red triangle highlighting the South Tower. Uh, next slide. Here we have the PDA, as we've heard from many other people, including the BPDA staff, uh, talking about its uh, component and what we are talking about today. Next slide. 
here we have a floor plan of the area. On the right, we see pictures of the outdoor plaza area. I want to talk about what is going to happen in the South Tower on, uh, for the students. We will have a dedicated entrance only for students. We will be separating the tower from the hotel guests. So there is no interaction between hotel guests and students, reiterating a safe environment for the students. Amenities will be provided for students within the South Tower, including fitness, study areas, laundry, uh, as well as dedicated staff areas for the resident life folks. Each floor has a resident assistant uh, available to the students. Um, and as Kathy Spiegelman had mentioned, uh, all the procedures that they have in place for other dorm environments are in place here for safety, security, um, and student well-being and health. The outdoor plaza will be renovated, um, as you will hear in a moment, um, to be able to really add to the existing uh, public realm. Um, we are very excited to be able to talk about this. And I will turn it over to the next slide to Ray Dunnitz. Thank you, Julie. Uh, I'm Ray Dennis, landscape architect. Um, the existing plaza is um, very hot and uh, devoid of any planting at this time. Uh, our proposal is to uh, really make this more of a green oasis and um, uh, implement some new shade trees, deciduous shade trees um, with high canopies to allow views into the uh, the plaza and to the building. I'll also green up all the uh, plant beds that are currently devoid of any plants. Um, we've added uh, some site furnishing amenities, uh, picnic tables and chairs um, to uh, for people to gather, as well as four back bike racks, which will accommodate up to eight bicycles. Um, the plaza is currently accessed uh, in a frick sloped walk. Um, from the sidewalk uh, up into the plaza. And next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, gives sort of a perspective view of the plaza um, with uh, the new planters, bike racks. Um, the existing brick paving will be maintained, uh, but you can see the nice uh, shade trees sort of offering a nice closure to this uh, landscape. Next, please. Here's a view um, from uh, Belvedere Street. Um, Belvedere Street, I'm sorry, um, showing uh, the view of the, the new canopy that will sort of bring the building down to grade and also provide a lot of shade um, for, for a plaza that currently is, is in full sun. Next, please. Can we turn have. It over, really? Yep. Thank you, Ray. Here we have the new dedicated bike room for residents of the, the student residents of the tower. Uh, and so this will have direct access from the street area. Uh, it has a variety of styles of racks, uh, both the two tier racks as well as vertical bike storage. Um, and so this is only for the student residents, as we said, um, and this is in addition to the eight visitor bike um, spots that Ray had mentioned earlier. Uh, this was, as you heard earlier, uh, part of a long process um, that the community really helped us with to make this a, an important feature of the project. And so with that, next slide. We thank you. This concludes the presentation about the project. We are very excited and ex thankful for all of the BPDA staff involved in helping this happen, as well as the community uh, as well. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, and as this is a public hearing, we're gonna first start with a uh, testimony from the public. Secretary Bohemus, do we have anyone who would like to testify? Joan Carragher, you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, so my name's Joan Carriger, and I'm the president of the St. Patolf Neighborhood Association. And the St. Patolf Neighborhood is the neighborhood that is tucked in 
kind of uh, adjacent to Northeastern um, and kind of parallel to Huntington. So we're across from, from this area. Um, we, I just wanted to say that uh, we are very much in support of this. Northeastern has proven to be a, a fantastic neighbor uh, because not, not only are we adjacent to Northeastern, but we do have a number of graduate students who live in apartments throughout our neighborhood and also currently the Midtown Hotel, which is in our area, is um, being used as a dorm for, North for Northeastern. And um, we are very much appreciative of the folks at Northeastern. They're, whenever we've had a problem, an issue, or a question, they're very responsive. Um, they keep an eye on things. and. Um, so we're very much in support of this. And besides being uh, good neighbors, we also are very much in favor of this type of repurposing of a building. Um, it's such a wonderful idea. And um, I think it only has, I think it's a win-win situation for us all. And having just seen the plans uh, for the fact that you're going to green up that area, uh, that I have to say uh, is just a wonderful, will be another wonderful positive about this project. So thank you very much. Thank you. Jamie McNeil, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Secretary, Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is Jamie McNeil. I'm the general agent for the unit, uh, Free Night here, the uh, Hotel Employees Union here in Boston. We represent about 12,000 uh, hospitality workers, including the workers at the Sheridan. Um, I'd like to go on uh, record in support of this project. Um, I really give credit to the project team, all the project team, um, for coming to us, you know, hearing any concerns, minimizing any disruption um, uh, that the current workforce um, might have faced and, um, you know, just really uh, having a collaborative approach to this project. Um, in addition to, you know, creating lots of housing, um, right, in, in Fenway and in, uh, in the Back Bay and, um, and uh, uh, as well, um, union construction jobs, um, which we're very much in favor of. So uh, just like to go on strong support uh, on this project and thank the BPDA staff for all their hard work on it. Thank you, Jamie. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Chair, members of the board, this is Minor Perez representing hundreds of union carpenters that live work for the city of Boston. Uh, I'd like to go on record on strong support of this uh, proposal. Uh, for many years, we have been asking of our universities and colleges to please get dormitories to house students on site. I remember these uh, conversations are a way to back to the Menino administration. And I would say that it needs to be recognized that no recent university has been doing the right thing over and over every year. Um, and we are in great, we are in strong support of this propo proposal. Um, and this is something that is going to help everybody. And it's definitely going to alleviate the needs of housing in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minor. Lee Steele, you can unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, Lee Steele, uh, member of the uh, St. Patolf Neighborhood Association uh, on their board, and also a member of the IAG for this, uh, for this project. Um, I think, in general, there's very strong support, uh, both within the neighborhood and amongst the IAG, for this uh, very creative reuse of a, of a property uh, that's probably past its prime, and the fact that um, the use that's being proposed is basically a continuation of uh, what's been happening over the, over the last three, four years as a result of the uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Um, we in the neighborhood um, believe that if Northeastern indeed is going to be the long-term uh, tenant uh, for this property, we couldn't ask for a better neighbor. Uh, I echo uh, Joan, our president's uh, uh, comments uh, in terms of how helpful and responsive they've been uh, to our neighborhood's issues uh, as they uh, uh, temporarily occupied the Midtown Hotel. And we expect uh, the relationship with Northeastern to 
you know, to continue to go forward, be productive, and uh, uh, think this is an absolutely terrific project uh, 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 to go forward with, and uh, we absolutely support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Shatan Green, you can unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Shatan Green. Um, I'm a Boston resident uh, and also business agent for the Boston 30 Trade Union. I want to say thank you to the BBDA for facilitating these um, important meetings and including the community voice. I also want to say thank you to Hawk Hawkins Capital, um, Hawkins Lake Capital for being great partners. Um, this project is, is great in so many different ways, but um, creating a better experience for the students that choose to go to school here, um, while, while also opening up more homes for the residents and new, new people that come and live here. Um, so I appreciate um, all the hard work and dedication and planning that goes into making this awesome project. So I speak uh, in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Shatan. Would anybody else like to testify about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. Mimi has her hand up and down. I'm just gonna... Mimi, did you wanna testify about this project? Yes, I would like to. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Um, hi everyone, this is Mimi Clemens. Um, as you all know, I'm an Alston resident. Uh, before, I actually lived in Mission Hill uh, near North, uh, Northeastern. Um, I would um, just say I'm, I'm fully in support of this project. In fact, if, if the universities uh, here would, would uh, be able to, to repurpose some of the older hotels and uh, larger buildings for dormitories, that would be wonderful. Uh, it's put um, a lot of this, the student housing has put a lot of pressure on um, a lot of the neighborhoods in, all, um, in Boston, especially Alston and Mission Hill. Uh, so it, any way just to alleviate that pressure would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to testify about this project? Madam Chair, this concludes the public hearing portion of this item. Awesome. Uh, let's go to questions and comments from the board. <clears throat> through, the, through the chair, quick question. Um, as far as Northeastern, uh, with this newly found um, long-term home, will this um, kind of scrap the 800 block Columbus Ave project that the dormitory that you guys were looking at um, in your master plan? or? Is that still on the table as well? No, that project uh, is still on the table. It's actually um, Quinn from the BPDA staff referenced the fact that we are adding this project to the IMP amendment for that dormitory. We are interested in increasing our supply of student housing um, here and at, with you building the uh, dorm at 840 Columbus on a former parking lot that we own. Additional comments or questions? Um, I do have uh, a few. Um, so this isn't, uh, just to preface, I, I think this is a, a good project um, and, uh, you know, good uh, use conversion, right, topically. Um, this is just more from a Northeastern, and so why, I, you know, we have you here. Just trying to get some context on, you know, can you just refresh my memory and, and go back to uh, where we are again in the IMP cycle and when we can expect, you know, when we can expect the next, um, the timing of the next plan to come before and any amendments and just trying to. Sure. So the amendment that I referenced for the uh, 840 Columbus dormitory and for um, adding this project, the Belvedere dorm to our IMP, is actively under review now at the BPDA, and we're expecting that it will be um, before the board in the next couple months. Um, we had, uh, the, our last master plan was 2013. Um, it technically would have expired at the end of 2023, and the BPDA gave us an extension 
in order for us to complete a comprehensive look at, into the next 10 years. So as Quinn referenced, we're expecting to submit that this spring uh, and put it under review in the balance of, the, of 2024. Okay. Um, so I guess broad strokes, like how, how does this impact, right? Okay, let me just be, let me just be completely like tra transparent on, on the, you know, uh, some concerns, right? Um, so uh, I know in the past we've had situations where, or there was a situation that I remember that stuck with me where Northeastern accidentally overrolled students, and so we were gonna like, you were gonna correct that by like under enroll. Sorry, I talked my hands. <laughs> You're going to correct that by like in the next couple years by making those classes smaller. Um, you know, just trying to get us an update on kind of where we are and where where my concern comes from is I just want to make sure, right, that we are we you know we already know right that we have the student housing shortage, right, like, and and I get that we're you're moving towards that and we're getting there. What I don't, what I am concerned about is whether or not is 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 whether or not Northeastern is controlling the um, the student enrollment population that will can like pace right with the development around us and 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 help you know make sure we're not going backwards right and and having um, impacts to the community. Um, so I'm not sure if that makes sense, but but maybe you can give an update on that whole. Sure, um, it makes a lot of sense, and it is the topic of conversation for us at almost every public hearing. Uh, that we attend. We do, we have a large population, we have students who go off on co-op, we have students who study abroad and come back. We have a number of programs that are somewhat unique from some of the other institutions in Boston, and that has always led to us housing a different percentage of our students at any particular time. And so um, when we did get more students accepting our acceptances uh, on the tail end of COVID, that's when we uh, that's when we put students in hotels and we were doing all of that on a temporary basis we made a commitment and we have lived by that commitment and we report our numbers to the city every fall as required and we actually have a task force our institutional task force meeting next week when we're going to share more information about what actually is happening right now but we did agree that we would lower our the, the freshmen that we would enroll um, until we got back to the normal number of freshmen, which is about 3,500. So we, we have done that, um, but we still have students who live in the neighborhoods, and it's uh, a course that we're on with the city of Boston to try and have that not have negative impacts on our community neighbors. Kelly, you're muted. Yeah. Um, great. That's that's helpful for context, and uh, I'm really glad to hear that it is a topic that's being uh, that's being discussed a lot <laughs> right now, um, and and being addressed. Just you know, again, wanted to do uh, you know my due diligence as a board member, right? And we're trying to take these. Um, uh, it's been nine years. There's been a lot of projects. <laughs> I to try and remember. Um, kind of the bigger picture, and that's what the IMP really helps helps me to do, all of our plans really, like help us to do, like, okay, like, I can go back to the IMP, see where this fits in, and just because we're in that real, uh, you know, we gave that extension, understandably, um, this is helpful, and, and me kind of like understanding and making sure, uh, it just in, in overseeing, right, the bigger picture and its impacts and, um, Again, I, I like the repurpose of this. Just this is helpful for context. Sure, appreciate it. All right. Um, any additional questions or comments? Okay. Hearing and seeing none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. <laughs> I know it's a new role. Um, okay. Uh, roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Um, thank you very much, uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so we can um, see.
see, agenda item number two. So we have fourth public hearing. Um, and that is agenda item number 32. Uh, simultaneous Mandarin and Cantonese interpretations are being provided for this meeting using the language interpretation function within Zoom. We ask that you be patient in case of any technical issues. Language interpretation will not be enabled until instructions on how to access interpretation have been translated. Once interpretation has been enabled, a globe icon will appear at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, an important reminder to all who are presenting and commenting today, we ask that you speak slowly for the interpreter. If you're speaking too fast, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak slower so that the translator can catch up with the information. So thank you in advance. To enable the interpretation service for Mandarin or Cantonese, please click on the globe icon in the bottom of your screen and select the language you wish to hear. And you must also mute original audio. Uh, Terry, will you now please give the uh, instructions that I gave in Mandarin? Sure. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh,大家好,我叫Terry,我今天的普通话的翻译,我会跟我的同事一起跟大家做这个普通话的翻译。待会那边会下方呢,会看到一个地球图标,您点选地球的图标,然后再选择Mandarin普通话,你就可以听
please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. And Quinn, uh, you may now, oh, please <laughs> begin the presentation. Thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Polimus and Director Jemison. The proposal before you now is for an Article 80 large project known as the 287 Western Avenue project in the Alston neighborhood and an associated PDA development plan for what will become plan development area number 148. The proposed project is for a mixed use building containing approximately 92,000 square feet of gross floor area comprised of office and R&D space, a replacement space for Boston EMS facility, shared amenity space, and approximately 3,000 square feet of ground floor, public co-working and meeting space designed as a resource for the community to work remotely outside of their homes. The project includes parking for up to 36 vehicles, indoor bike parking space for at least 36 bicycles, and will be designed to target LEED gold standards. The project uh, will also construct low stress separated bike lanes along Western Avenue to link into the broader community network in line with what was envisioned in the Western Avenue corridor rezoning study. The proponents are providing approximately 1,700 square feet of space for Boston EMS to continue operation of a two ambulance bay facility on this site for at least the next 10 years with options to renew for additional term in the future. The modern facility complete with amenities such as lockers, showers, a kitchenette and break room will be an improvement over the existing converted, converted warehouse space that exists on site today. The BPDA held a virtual IAG meeting for this project on November 27th, 2023 and a virtual public meeting on November 20th, 2023. Both meetings were well attended and the public meeting was advertised in the local newspaper and online. I want to thank BPDA staff, IAG members, members of the public, and Council Braden's office who all contributed their time and efforts to improving this project through the course of our review. I now turn it over to my colleague Ben Zunkler from the BPDA Zoning Compliance Team to discuss the planning context that was considered in the review of this project before the development team begins their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn, and hello again, Madam Chair and members of the board. The proposed project, governed by Article 51, is PDA eligible and falls within the various corner community commercial subdistricts of the Alston Brighton Neighborhood District. It is aligned with the Western Avenue Corridor Study and Rezoning Plan, otherwise known as the Wacker Z Plan, which was adopted by the board in 2022. Additionally, the proposed project respects neighborhood wide studies concerning transportation and public realm. BBDA staff considered zoning, the Wacker Z Plan, and the character of the surrounding context in our review of this proposed project. Next slide, please. The Wacker Z Plan envisions an interconnected and vibrant mixed use district. Staff review ensured compliance with the building, use, the building uses and dimensions proposed in the plan, as well as mobility goals, complete street design guidelines, the open space vision, and the accommodation of a wide Western Avenue. During our review, vehicular access was aligned with both uses and transit goals, as well as long-term public use and availability of public services being ensured, as Quinn mentioned. Next slide, please. Staff review focused on the building design and materials, accessible routes and spaces, long-term mobility projects, and sustainability initiatives. The proposed building reflects the urban design intent of the Wacker Z plan, and furthers public realm, realm and transportation goals. The proposal is compliant with both the Boston Complete Street guidelines and includes a high performance building envelope exceeding requirements. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the board after the proponent presentation. Uh, thank you, Quinn. Thank you, Ben. Uh, my name is Brian Grossaru uh, from King Street Properties. I'm a director of development here. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking again Quinn and Ben for their um, guidance and input along with the rest of the staff at the BPDA. Uh, I'd like to also start by thanking our IAG, our neighbors in Alston Brighton, uh, Chief Fooley of Boston EMS, and Councilor Braden for their valuable input into the planning of this project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these, these next couple slides have uh, been covered in his introduction here, but we started with uh, just an overview of the area context here. So we're in the Barry's Corner neighborhood of Lower Alston, um, just south of Soldiers Field Road. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so this is just an aerial view to give a better understanding of the built uh, atmosphere, the built conditions around the site. Um, again, you can see Western Avenue running east to west across the middle of your screen uh, with the subject property 287 Western Avenue located just to the north. Next slide, please. So the existing conditions uh, present today are a two-story vacant office building uh, with a warehouse use in the rear of the site currently utilized by Boston EMS. Uh, and then to the east of the um, two-story office building is a also a vacant uh, former auto body shop. Uh, you can see the three, the three car bay single-story white building there in pictures three and four. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the, um, this is a, a life science project uh, we're envisioning for this parcel here. And one thing that differentiates this project from others that you may have seen is that this is focused on graduation, uh, graduation lab research and development space. Now, what that is, is that is a inter small to intermediate sized tenant suite that is fully fit out and constructed as part of the core and shell construction. So um, it allows tenants to come in and take occupancy without having to undertake uh, a long and costly construction project. And it also allows for younger, smaller companies to stay within this corridor and not have to take on large equipments than they might otherwise be able to financially. Um, the space is also, as was uh, mentioned in the onset, uh, going to be a new home to the EMS substation. Um, it's important to note here that there'll be no downtime or service coverage in the neighborhood. EMS, uh, while this project is under development, will relocate to a building just adjacent to this one on McDonald Avenue. And then when construction is completed, um, they'll come into this building, again, no lapse in service. Um, the building's approximately 92,000 feet. Um, and will accommodate a complete street design, um, as was mentioned at the onset. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to just take a second to talk about the Wacker Z, uh, the Western Avenue Corridor and Rezoning Study that was put in place for this neighborhood specifically. The um, you can see the star on the map on the top left of the screen in zone 2B and 2B2. Um, we took great care in our development process to make sure we were within the recommended guidelines for this area. Um, most notably, the floor area ratio. Uh, maximum here is 3.5. Our project is a modest 1.6, significantly below the maximum guideline. Um, we also have a significantly lower height than would be available under our PDA. Uh, we have a maximum of 75 feet along Western Avenue and uh, 80 feet in the rear of the site, which is approximately 95 feet below the maximum allowable. Next slide, please. Uh, now we'd like to turn it over to Matt Pierce of Perkins and Will, the project's architect. Hello everybody, good evening. Um, this is a view of uh, the south elevation of the project you're standing on western avenue looking north and what this illustrates is <clears throat> part of what uh, brian was explaining previously about the wacker z zoning uh, basically these dashed lines here show the maximum uh, height that's buildable within the new wacker z zoning and as you can see we're well uh, under that height limit and very intentionally kind of stepping down the mass and making a transition from the larger um, building to the left, which is 305 Western Avenue, currently under construction, and kind of stepping down a scale as we move. As we move to the east, uh, we have a kind of three-story lab piece on the west side of our site, and then the two-story amenity piece uh, on the east side of the site, and that transitions to the multifamily triple-decker to the east, the art house, and so on as you move your way east. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> and from the same uh, vantage point down at street level, perspective here, uh, you get a similar view of the project along Western Avenue. Again, to the left is a three-story lab office volume uh, with a fair amount of transparency and those active uses <clears throat> on all three stories overlooking Western Avenue. Uh, on the right-hand side is a two-story amenity piece uh, of which the ground floor is publicly accessible as a co-working space. 
Uh, that again is a two-story building, so again transitioning from uh, to a lower scale as we move as we move from west to east. And then in the center of the image is a uh, public garden that's really an extension of that co-working space. So it'll create a really unique, um, intimately scaled uh, garden space that kind of fits within the tapestry of offerings of kind of public spaces and gardens and parks within the uh, Alston neighborhood. Next. <clears throat> when we come around to McDonald Avenue, McDonald Avenue is a few feet uh, lower than Western Avenue, so the, the uh, road slopes down on Speedway down to McDonald. Uh, this is where we have, again, three stories of lab and office, actually two stories of lab and office above the street here, the third being in the screened uh, mechanical area. Then the mechanical uh, rooftop screen is actually set back from the street, as you can see here, to minimize the sense of scale uh, to the pedestrians on the street. We have the garage entry for parking under the building in the foreground. And as you move down to the left of the, uh, of the frame, there's the uh, loading entry and at the far end, the EMS phase uh, that Brian mentioned. Next. <clears throat> um, here we have the kind of composite ground floor plan really at Western Avenue, because as I mentioned, uh, McDonald Avenue is lower than Western Avenue, so this is looking at the floor plan at the level of Western Avenue. Again, the left-hand side, uh, lab and office space in blue, uh, the green planted courtyard in the center, and the pink being the co-working space, uh, the accessible, publicly accessible co-working space on the right of that smaller scale element. The lobby uh, for the tenants of the building at the back of that courtyard, so the courtyard is uh, kind of a transition space back to that lobby. And then we have uh, that highway space, which is the unique uh, feature of the project. And below that, at McDonald Avenue level, is the EMS, which is in the top right there <clears throat> at the corner of Speedway and McDonald, and to the left of that, the loading bays. Next. And this is just zooming in on that uh, courtyard space, which is a unique characteristic of the project. As you can see in green at the bottom of the frame, uh, along Western Avenue, those are the uh, uh, complete street improvements with a separate bike lane, planting, and furniture zone. Uh, the blue indicates what sort of the, uh, the wider part, the entry part of the uh, public plaza, which uh, connects to the, that streetscape on Western Avenue. And is really a continuation. It works, works as an extension of that indoor um, co-working space. And then as you move north on the site, in purple indicated here is that the planting area of the garden, which really becomes a viewing garden and a place where you uh, transition from the public space into the entry of the building. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next, we'd just like to uh, address transportation-related topics. So this project will have 36 below-grade parking spaces, which is a ratio of 0.4 spaces per 1,000 square feet. Uh, this ratio is 50% below BTD's maximum recommended parking, parking ratio for R&D space. Um, these 36 spaces also represent a 50% a 50 reduction in existing parking spaces. There are currently 72 on site. Um, in addition to the, the vehicular parking spaces, we'll have secure indoor bike parking. Um, we'll be making a contribution to the Blue Bike program. We'll have EV charging stations inside. Um, as you saw in our site plan, we'll be eliminating all curb cuts on Western Avenue to allow for the construction of the complete streets uh, and bike lane environment. Uh, next slide. Um, lastly, we just would like to summarize the project. So we will be providing a new modernized Boston EMS substation with uh, most importantly, no lapse in service to the Austin Brighton neighborhood. Um, we'll be reducing our impact on the roadway transit system by removing 50% of parking, existing parking on site. Um, we'll be creating public co-working and meeting space for Alston Brighton residents. This will be fully fit out amenitized workspace with free Wi-Fi and reservable conference rooms um, and uh, full-time security on site to um, alleviate those who are confined to a work from home environment and give them a place to get out of their office uh, and work in a professional environment. Um, in addition, we anticipate this project will produce approximately $1 million of net new annual property tax revenues to the city of Boston. Um, and lastly, we have uh, notably lower height and density uh, as contemplated in the Western Avenue Corridor rezoning study. Thank you.
Okay, great. Does that conclude the presentation? Yes, it does. Perfect. Um, okay, good job. Let's see. Let's start with this is a public hearing. So let's start with the testimony from the public. Secretary Polhemus, do we have anyone who would like to testify? Sure, we're going to start with Chief Holy. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, uh, uh, board members. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to provide some testimony in support of the development plans of 287 Western Ave. As chief of the department, I'm, represent, I'm presenting this testimony on behalf of Boston Emergency Medical Services with the city's municipal ambulance service and the Bureau of the Boston Public Health Commission. Our EMTs and paramedics responded to over 130,000 uh, distinct clinical incidents in Boston just last year. Uh, and of which well, about 8,000 were just in Austin and Brighton uh, alone. Uh, the principal ambulances that cover uh, the neighborhoods of Brighton and Austin are uh, ambulances for uh, 14 ambulance nine, which are uh, which are housed currently at this uh, location. Uh, Boston EMS has lease space on from Harvard University on McDonald Ave for over 15 years now serving the community. Uh, they've been uh, uh, terrific landlords, partners, and uh, I like to think that we've been uh, good tenants. Uh, and uh, well, with, with year over year call volume increasing, uh, coupled uh, with uh, uh, commercial developments, uh, uh, the need for additional EMS coverage is uh, an unprecedented demand on our system. The proposed EMS station will allow for two ambulances to be posted, offering the necessary amenities to include crew lockers, showers, a kitchenette, a break room, and uh, uh, spaces for uh, parking for the uh, four crew members. That's two per, per ambulance that's in service at any given time. Uh, we uh, look forward. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. We look forward to maintaining the service provision to the residents and visitors of Austin uh, and Brighton uninterrupted, which is uh, most important, which uh, uh, you, you heard earlier, uh, that's uh, it's uh, pretty unprecedented to have that opportunity where uh, Harvard is being so gracious to uh, provide uh, swing space for us to work out of uh, while this work goes on so that we won't have to skip a beat uh, providing service. And, and I really just want to uh, 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 really, uh, I know all these people out, but I would really just, uh, I want to thank uh, Howard University, uh, uh, particularly a uh, whole city of Boston friend, uh, executive president, vice president, uh, uh, Merrick Dwayne, Wayne, <coughs> excuse me, uh, King Street Properties, uh, everybody working with there, uh, folks from the May, uh, obviously our mayor's office and uh, neighborhood services, Councilor Braden, of course, uh, the BPD, BPDA, and uh, especially uh, Deputy Director uh, Master Planning and Policy, uh, Napoleon Monani, who's been uh, helping us very much with this. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chief. John Cusack, you can unmute yourself. John, you can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. This is John yes. Cusack from Brighton. Uh, I just want to echo what the chief said. The idea of this being uninterrupted service is fantastic. Uh, I, the fact that they've kept the project under the height and density of Wacker Z shows a great deal of respect for the community. Uh, I think I think they're doing a, a terrific job uh, on the job they have currently uh, with continuing construction as far as keeping keeping Western Ave in in in, in, use, in, in, in usable order. Uh, and I really like this design. So um, I, I would like to go on record as saying I'm, I'm very strongly in favor of this project. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yangbo Nu, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Yangbo Nu. I'm a resident, I live nearby at the 287 Everett uh, Street. Um, I, I love this 27 Western Avenue project, and, and one thing I particularly like is the, the co-working space, like open to the public for those who work remotely, which I'm like one of those people. 
So I, I, I also believe that this project, together with the, uh, the Austin Lab Works project that is going on, will make this like neighborhood like a more a better place for people to live and work and relax. So thus, I just want to be on the record to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Rainer Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Chair, members of the board, Maina Perez here representing the Carpenters Union. On behalf of hundreds of union carpenters that live and work throughout the city of Boston, I want to go on record and strong support of this project. Thank you, Miner. Shatan Green, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Shatan Green, uh, lifelong proud Boston resident, also the business agent for the Boston Building Trades Unions. We represent over 35,000 um, workers with thousands of uh, workers who live right here in the city. Um, I want to thank the BBDA um, for facilitating these important meetings and listening to the community voice. Um, I look. We look forward to working with uh, King Street Properties. Um, and yeah, this is gonna be a great project, great careers built. Um, and we know that great careers build strong communities. So I'm just looking forward to this project and uh, probably support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Shatan. Would anybody else like to testify about this project? Please raise your virtual hand if you would. Madam Chair, this concludes the public hearing portion of this item. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, questions and comments from the board. Uh, through the chair, uh, just one quick question. Um, as far as um, the lab spaces, uh, you said they're going to be like pre built. Are they going to be spec labs where someone can come in and change it, or is it as is for someone that a smaller company that wants to come in and uh, lease out space? Uh, thank you for the question. The labs will be pre-built with um, office furniture, uh, lab casework, uh, all the necessary HVAC and electrical components needed to run uh, a small research and development laboratory. Um, these are intended to be uh, have minimal investment by the tenant. It's really intended to be um, an easy option to keep younger companies that are just uh, in the formation stage and keep them from having to put out uh, the intensive capital um, investment required to, to build a customized space. We're really trying to build um, a suite that is usable by uh, a wide bandwidth of users. Thank you. Okay, great. Additional questions or comments? Okay, hearing and saying none, the motion is in order. So moved. Second. I'll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Insmark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Great project. Congratulations. Good luck. Um, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> They're all good. I like this one. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cheers. Um, let's go back. Let's see. We were on, so go back to agenda item number 17. Is that correct? Um, Secretary Williams? That is correct. Just need a, a double check today. Um, okay, item number 17. Request authorization to issue a request for proposals for squares and streets transportation planning support services for a contract term not to exceed 18 months and an additional one year option to extend the contract for a total amount not to exceed $600,000 and to take all related actions. Lydia. Thank you so much and good evening, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Secretary Bohemus, and Director Jemison. My name is Lydia Housley and I'm a senior transportation planner in the BPD's transportation infrastructure department. I am here today to request authorization for the secretary to advertise and issue a request for proposals to engage a consultant team to support the transportation planning team and other city of Boston agencies as part of the city's squares and streets initiative. Um, next slide, please. Um, Square and Streets is our cross-disciplinary planning and zoning initiative focused on Boston's transit accessible squares and main streets, 
Spacious Streets plans will take a comprehensive approach to planning for the kind of small tight area right around a neighborhood commercial center or a transit station and stop um, throughout Boston's neighborhoods. Through a six to nine month public process uh, led by the comprehensive planning team and in partnership with many other city of Boston departments, plans are ultimately expected to include zoning reforms, programs to promote and retain affordable housing, businesses and cultural spaces, climate resilience interventions, and of course, transportation and public space investments. On this final point, Squares and Streets plans will provide a really important opportunity to take a fine-grained transportation planning analysis and design lens to some of Boston's most important neighborhood centers. The RFP request we have brought before you today includes a strategic capacity augmentation program to support this transportation work in up to six discrete planning areas over the course of 18 months. And I do want to emphasize that this work will be really closely coordinated with the Streets Cabinet with a focus on implementation actions that can be completed within 10 years. Next slide, please. I am just going to quickly walk through the scope and evaluation criteria that we've established for this RFP. Um, in, in short, there are four tasks, data review and collection, existing conditions analyses, recommendations, and then implementation planning support. And for evaluation criteria, we'll be focused on evaluating the quality of the team and the quality of the understanding and approach included in the proposal. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, some of the key deliverables I did want to highlight coming out of these and just to stress um, how important we really see transportation as being um, really central to these plans for data review and collection. We uh, plan to use consultant services to help augment some really important data collection needs. Uh, in specific, we will do area specific user counts um, so that we have up to date information. We will complete public on and off street parking and curbside inventory to support um, curbside management planning and do a full inventory of crosswalk and bus stop inventories. Next slide, please. For our existing conditions analyses, we will uh, be planning to augment support with some discrete and uh, fairly technical analyses of pedestrian environments, bus service quality, um, so how fast are the buses, where are we here seeing pinch points, and both transit and vehicle capacity analyses for key routes and intersections. Next slide. The recommendations portion of the, uh, the consultant task will include um, a wide range of maps, concept plans, and policy recommendations for the kind of laundry list of topics you see on the screen here, covering everything from safety and accessibility to getting our bus stops and bus routes ready for the implementation of the MBTA's bus network redesign, uh, climate ready streets, you name it, it'll be um, pretty comprehensive, though varied from place to place to meet the needs of that place. And next slide. Finally, we will uh, rely on folks to help bring about cost estimates for priority capital projects and identify funding options, including state, federal, and philanthropic sources to augment city of Boston existing operating um, and programmatic budgets that we can use for implementation. Um, that's, I think, next slide. I have one more just to say thank you. I was just going to say that in total, it's expected that we would spend no more than $600,000 on this contract, which would be funded through the operating budget for planning. And we uh, you know, would hope to return to you in the early spring for authorization to enter into a contract with the most qualified consultant team resulting from the RFP process. And with that, I will take um, any, any questions and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Lydia. Um, any questions or comments from the Okay, I think this looks great. Um, really excited for squares and streets, so uh, let's take a vote. <laughs> uh, a motion is in order. So moved. <clears throat> Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you. Item number 18. Request authorization to increase the total program value for the existing transportation planning, analysis, and design on call program by $175,000 and to take all related actions. Lydia. Thank you, and good evening, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Secretary Bohemus, and Director Jemison. I am back again. My name is Lydia. I'm a senior transportation planner on the transportation infrastructure team. Uh, with this request, I'm here today to request authorization for the director to increase the total program value for our existing transportation planning analysis and design on call by an amount of $175,000 for a program total of $875,000. 
On June 15th of 2023, and following a competitive RFP process, the BPDA board authorized the director to enter into a contract with five on-call consultant teams for transportation planning analysis and design consultant services for a total program budget of $700,000. Since finalizing these contracts last year, the transportation planning team has utilized the on-call to quickly advance high priority work through five separate work orders to date, covering a wide range of transportation disciplines and practices, including citywide parking reform analyses, design advancement of some critical safety projects in South Boston, and comprehensive transportation planning for areas that are experiencing development pressures and for which limited transportation planning has taken place. The ability to utilize industry leading expertise and augment our own staff capacity as needed has been exceptionally helpful to the transportation planning team. And having utilized the majority of the value of the original contract and with additional priority work on the horizon, the request before you today is to increase the program budget by $175,000 to be uh, distributed through those same contracts that are already in place. Um, thank you for your time and consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great, thanks. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. For that's Mark. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair of that's aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Lydia. All right, item number 19. Request authorization to enter into a contract for consulting services with Grayscale Collaborative LLC in an amount not to exceed $800,000 and for a term of up to 22 months for the Austin Brighton Community Plan and to take all related actions. Ben. Thank you, Madam Chair Rojas, members of the board, Secretary Colhemus, and Director Jemison. For this item, I'm here before you on behalf of BPDA staff to request authorization for the director to enter into a contract with Grayscale Collaborative LLC to assist the BPDA in creating a comprehensive plan for the neighborhoods of Alston and Brighton, the Alston Brighton Community Plan that I mentioned earlier. The RFP for planning design services was issued in October of last year. The approximately 22 month effort will focus on planning for the next three to 10 years with policy, zoning, and implementation recommendations coordinated to create an equitable future. Through the RFP process, BPDA staff sought a respondent to perform work across scales and topics. The work will build on the findings and recommendations of the Austin Brighton Needs Assessment and explore new methods of engagement and outreach across five phases that will culminate in a final report. Next slide, please. The BPDA received two proposals for the Alston Brighton Community Plan, an evaluation committee composed of BPDA Planning Division staff and a representative from Council Braden staff evaluated the teams based on three criteria, content, team, and approach. While both responses were well prepared and highly advantageous, the Grayscale Collaborative and Agency Landscape and Planning team received the highest composite rating from the evaluation committee for their holistic proposed approach. In their response and interview, the team demonstrated a collaborative work and presentation style, elaborating on their approach through live discussion. The team includes Tool, RKG, and the Alston Brighton Health Collaborative, who together with the lead firms bring experience in innovation and nuanced engagement and deep local knowledge. The awarded contract will be in an amount not to exceed $800,000 for up to 22 months. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Okay. Hearing and saying none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Item number 20, request authorization to convey urban renewal parcel X-28B Charlestown Urban Renewal Area Project Number Mass R-55, located at Zero School Street in Charlestown, pursuant to the Abutters Parcel Program, and to take all related actions. Natalie. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, parcel X-28B in the Charlestown Urban Renewal Area, known as Zero School Street, contains 65 square feet of land between 67 School Street and 69 School Street in the Charlestown neighborhood. In September 2023, the BPDA offered the parcel for disposition and improvement as part of the Abutter Parcels Program, which is a program designed to convey vacant, unbuildable parcels located throughout the city of Boston to abutting a residential property owners to bring underutilized parcels back to a more beneficial use. On October 16th, um, 
David Farley, Jean Farley, Joan Farley, Suzanne Travis, Bernard Farley, William Farley, and John Farley, who are the owners of the property abutting the parcel, submitted their request to purchase the property. The applicants are all siblings who inherited the property from their parents. They will pay the appraised value of $4,700. It is staff recommendation that the BPA board authorize the director to dispose of Zero School Street under the Abutter Parcels Program. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Ms. Mark? Aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. I love this program. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, 21. Request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the successful completion of the Seaport Square Block P project located at 400 Summer Street in the South Boston waterfront in accordance with Section C.6 of the cooperation agreement by and between the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development, uh, Boston Planning and Development Agency and Seaport NP title holder LLC and to take all related actions. This is a certificate of completion, so there's no presentation. Therefore, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Your Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 22, request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Section 80E Small Project Review of the Boston Zoning Code for the demolition and reconstruction of portions of a building located at uh, 1333, not so, 1334 Dorchester Avenue and to take all related actions. Zoe. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Chief Jamison and Secretary Polhemis. My name is Zoe Schutte, and I am a project assistant with Development Review. I am here before you to present the proposed Article 80 East Small Project located at 1334 Dorchester Avenue in Dorchester. The proposed project contemplates the demolition and reconstruction of portions of the existing HVAC retail supply office and storage building facing Ellsworth Street and Kimball Street. This replacement of exterior walls will be consistent with the industrial character of the existing building while improving aesthetics and allowing for improved operations for this local business. The project will result in a gross floor area of approximately 41,655 square feet, which is approximately 3,902 square feet smaller than the gross floor area of the existing building, resulting in a reduced floor area ratio of approximately 0.66. The resulting building height will remain unchanged at 31.5 feet and the accessory parking will be maintain, maintained unchanged at 50 spaces. After continued design review and revision with the BPDA urban design and transportation teams, the proponent agreed to improvements to existing sidewalks as well as the closure of one curb cut on Dorchester Avenue and increasing and decreasing curb, a curb cut on Ellsworth by 40 feet to advance safety. On October 31st, 2023, the BPDA received a small project review application from the proponent. The BPDA hosted a virtual public meeting on November 20th, 2023. The public meeting was advertised in the local newspapers and a notice was posted on the BPDA's calendar. The comment period ended on November 30th, 2023. I will now turn to Alana to take you through the planning context before the development team presents additional project details. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Bohemus, members of the board, and Director Jemison. My name is Ilana Hames, and I am the BPDA Zoning Compliance Planner assigned to this project. The proposed project at 1334 Dorchester Avenue is located in Article 65, the Dorchester Neighborhood District primarily within a neighborhood shopping subdistrict and partially within a local industrial subdistrict for a portion of the existing accessory surface parking. The project scope involves exterior renovations, which will yield a reduction in gross floor area, as Zoe mentioned, and maintain the footprint and height of the existing structure. Therefore, new zoning relief is not anticipated. Next slide, please. 
Well, the project site is located within the boundaries of Plan Glover's Corner, which was released as a final draft in November 2019. This plan is not used as adopted city planning guidance. However, many of the recommendations from the plan align with current adopted citywide plans and policies referenced in the review of this proposal. These include recommendations for tree canopy enhancement in the 2022 Urban Forest Plan, Imagine Boston 2030 goals for job retention in existing neighborhoods, and complete street standards. The proposed project meets these plans and policies by maintaining and improving ex an existing neighborhood business, closing and shortening existing curb cuts on Dot Ave and Ellsworth Street to improve safety and adding a minimum of four new trees. After board approval, this proposed project will continue design review at BPDA. Thank you, and I will now turn it to the development team to present the project in more detail. Uh, good evening. My name is Jay Eigerman. I'm with the law firm of Ruben Junius and Rose. Also on the line is Brian Jones from Plumber Supply Company. First about the company, uh, it's family owned, uh, started in the late 1950s. We have about 18 to 20 locations in New England, but their headquarters is down in New Bedford, and that's where their distribution center is, which is important that this site will not be changed to a distribution center. Historically, it's been a uh, retail and warehouse and office site, and that's what it will remain. Next slide, please. This is the change uh, that, uh, the resulting uh, change to the exterior facade. The project is under 50,000 square feet, as you heard. So it's not subject to large project review, but it is subject to the design component of small project review because of the facade changes. This is a view looking southeasterly at the corner of Ellsworth and Dorchester Avenue. As you can see, the front door is actually not on Dorchester Avenue. It's set back from Ellsworth. To the left, you'll see where the warehouse uh, loading docks will be. Uh, in the center is where the entrance to the shopping area will be, and the offices are on the right. Next slide, please. This is to orient you, uh, but also to show you that the existing building is really a, a mishmash of additions and extensions starting in the late, I'm sorry, starting in 1963. Uh, the roof lines are all chaotic. So the purpose of the project is to invest a considerable amount of money to make this a, a modern facility. Next slide. Now, zooming in, uh, this shows you that there are numerous curb cuts. And as you heard from Zoe, uh, staff really pressed us to make sure that we minimize those curb cuts. So for example, uh, it is 60 feet of curb cut along Ellsworth on the lower left. Uh, but we're going to uh, drop that uh, down to 20 feet to match a 20 foot curb cut across Ellsworth where a residential project is going in. Uh, likewise, there are two curb cuts on Dorchester. We're going to be able to close the southerly one, that's the one on the right, uh, and bring trucks, you see some box trucks shown there, in and out of Kimball, so long as uh, BTD helps us with parking control just so the trucks can get in and out. And so we, uh, we agree with staff that that's really going to improve the streetscape on Dorchester. Next slide. Uh, this shows you uh, color-coded, that's the footprint of the building in orange, but these are green spaces that are going to be added. Historically and currently, there really was no greenery on the site, but working with staff, we found every area that we could green it up, and you heard there will be four uh, trees added as well. The customer parking lot is shown at the rear, that's the top left. Next slide, please. This is going to be the entrance to the shopping area. We worked again with staff to make sure the fenestration is more welcoming and consistent with guidelines in Dorchester for the shopping, uh, neighborhood shopping sub-district. Next slide. You could probably flip through these quickly. As, as you heard, it's really an industrial use of sorts. Um, all of these facades were reviewed by staff. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. This is a color coding, so you see what portions of the existing building are staying. They're shown in blue-green to the top left and the bottom left. And then the new structure that will be sewn into it is in yellow. Next slide. And that's the final slide, I believe. And we can take any questions, of course, from the board. Thank you. 
Awesome, thank you. Oh gosh, I was on, I wasn't on mute. So I said cool, because I think it's cool. <laughs> um, all right, uh, questions or comment from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Ms. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, congratulations to your Thank guests. you very much. Good night. I agree. Okay, uh, let's go with, oh, where did I go? I number 23. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 18 affordable home ownership units. Uh, 10 car parking spaces and 24 bar bicycle parking spaces located at 376 through uh, 384A Blue Hill Avenue and to take all related actions. Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Bohemius and Director Jemison. My name is Scott Greenall and I'm a project manager with Development Review. The proposed project before you is an Article 80 small project located at 376 to 384A Blue Hill Avenue in Dorchester. The project site is currently vacant, city-owned land, and this proposed project came about through a Mayor's Office of Housing, or MOH, Request for Proposal, or RFP. The proposed project comprises the construction of an approximately 23,313 gross square foot residential building that will include 18 affordable home ownership units and 10 off-street vehicle parking spaces. The proposed project will also include an interior bicycle storage room, providing 18 bicycle spaces for residents with an additional two spaces for employees and four exterior bicycle storage spaces. On September 22nd, 2023, the BPDA received a small project review application from the proponent. The BPDA hosted a virtual public meeting on November 9th. The public meetings were advertised in the local newspapers and a notice was posted on the BPDA's calendar. The comment period ended November 16th. I'll now turn it over to Ford Del Vecchio to cover the planning context before the development team begins the presentation. Thank you. Chair Rojas, uh, Secretary Blamus, members of the board and Director Jemison. My name is Ford Del Vecchio and I'm the BPDA zoning compliance reviewer assigned to this project. BPDA planners use the zoning, citywide plans and policies, local context including present density and recent construction, as well as community feedback in order to review the proposed project during the review process. The proposed project is located in Grove Hall on Blue Hill Avenue, a major city thoroughfare serving several key bus routes, which includes the 45 bus that connects the project site north to Nubian Square and Ruggles Station in South, Ruggles Station in south to Franklin Park at Columbia Road. This section of Blue Hill Avenue is characterized by three to four story blocks, which are primarily residential with ground floor retailers. These include bakeries, bodegas, salons, and banks. The side streets stemming from Blue Hill Ave are mainly residential, with two to three story detached structures, triple deckers, and multifamilies, characterizing an area with a variety of residential densities and strong architectural diversity. The proposed project is located within the boundaries of the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan adopted in 2004, with the goal to guide development for the next 10 to 20 years in the Roxbury neighborhood. Key elements of this plan include the enhancement of the civic and cultural environment, promoting a diverse economy and range of housing options, creating safer transportation connections and a lively public realm. Next slide, please. Based on these resources, this final slide outlines regulatory compliance and planning improvements in regards to the proposed project. The proposed project, which seeks to consolidate five city-owned parcels to form the project site, is located within multifamily residential slash local services subdistrict in the Roxbury neighborhood district. The proposed building is more than two times denser than required by zoning, which is primarily driven by the zero, inch, zero foot front and side setbacks. Our zero foot front set, setback is contextual with the building that book, buildings that bookend the proposed building and completes the street frontage on the currently empty parcel. Side lot lines are typically zero feet on this block as well. Thank you, and now I will turn it over to the development team to present the project in more detail. So I think I'll go ahead and step in here. I am actually um, one of the architects on the team. My name is Donald Respress. I uh, work for JG, JGE Architecture and Design. Just want to say good evening to uh, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, um, Director Jameson, and also members of the board. Um, I'll quickly walk you through these, uh, our presentation for, for this evening. Next chart, please. 
So this is just the area of view of our existing conditions. Um, just an infill project, you can see where our site is located in white, where we have buildings to the east and west of our site. Next chart. Uh, more existing photos, just to give you some context, uh, the current typologies where at the bottom is the retail level and up above uh, we have residential. Next chart. Development program at a glance, uh, by and large, where this project serves more than 83% of family style housing. Uh, our total lot area is right under 11,500 square feet. Uh, our gross build out is right under 26,000 square feet as well. Uh, and we're also going to be consistent with um, one to one resident bike storage parking as well. Let's start. Here's our site plan, just one, two, and we'll, I'll just talk this from, from, from top to bottom. You can see uh, towards the Blue Hill Avenue side where we're improving the, uh, the, the public realm. We're adding five new street trees. Uh, we have a very sizable community space that we're offering as well that's, that's north of 1,500 square feet. Uh, you can see the two retail spaces. And something that we're proud about is that we're offering a dual access for entry. As you can see there with the red arrows, the primary and secondary. As you move towards the rear of the site, we, we, have, we provide a very large open space. Um, this space uh, is north of 1,500 square feet, and we're working hard to, to keep the existing uh, tree that you see there at the, the south of the plant. Next chart. This is just an elevation view, just to sort of bring it all together. Um, compositionally, you can see how we're grounding the building. Um, keeping consistent with the current typologies on Blue Hill Ave with the red brick. As you move up to levels two and three, you can see where we're starting to introduce the punch window openings. And then as, you, as, we, as we break the cornice line up to the upper level, you can see we're starting to uh, improve the contrast and where we're switching our materials to fiber cement. And at the top left hand corner, you can see we have a pretty sizable um, open shared roof deck, which is over 1,500 square feet. Next chart. This is just an underneath view, so you can get a, a perspective of the, of the urban uh, streetscape there. You can see how we're being consistent with the, with the smart streets from Boston, the tree pits, the curb cuts. Uh, we're also thinking about the signage, what we're looking to do there, lighting improvements as well, uh, but a very diversified urban streetscape. Let's start. This is just the opposite view from the from the entry. Let's start. Looking at the rear, there's the tree that we're looking to to keep. Um, it's, it should provide a, a nice canopy of shade for residents. Uh, you can see the parking as well. We're offering ten parking spots. Let's start. And just another view, just to bring it all together, sort of tone down a little bit. You can see some of the lighting effects and some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, but this is very consistent with the, with the existing neighborhood. I think this is our last chart. I want to say thank you, everybody. Turn it back over to Scott. Or for the, for the board, where we can answer any questions. So thank you, Donald. Yeah, nothing, nothing more to say. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, questions and comments uh, from the board. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. I would just say I, it's great to see this, um, you know, filling such a critical need in terms of affordable home ownership. The fact that it's, you know, 100% of the units are affordable is just uh, amazing and really appreciate everybody's work on this. Great. Uh, additional questions or comments? Yeah, let's let, you know, uh, we'll let Kate speak for us on this one. It's, it's awesome. So with that, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. Good luck. Awesome job. Okay, item number. All right, I just lost my 
Request authorization to enter into an affordable housing agreement in connection with the proposed construction of nine residential home ownership units, including one IDP unit, located at 119 Madison Street, and to take all related actions. Caitlin. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Director Jemison, Secretary Polhemas, and members of the board. My name is Caitlin Coppinger. I'm the Deputy Director of Comprehensive Planning. Uh, tonight, I'm here to request your vote on an affordable housing agreement for the proposed development of 119 Addison Street in East Boston. This development proposes to build nine home ownership units, and while this didn't trigger Article 80 approval due to its size, the project team is voluntarily restricting one of its units as income restricted. Therefore, the vote in front of you tonight will allow the agency to enter into an agreement to dedicate this unit under the inclusionary development program at 80 percent ami i'm happy to answer any questions that you might have any questions or comments okay hearing and seeing none a motion is in order so moved second i'll call for a vote miss bennett aye Julian mark aye mr shepherd aye and the chair votes aye motion passes thanks caitlin Item number 25. Excuse me, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I'm, I recuse for this one, so I'll, I'll be back in a minute. Okay, sounds good, thank you so much. Um, item number 25, request authorization to adopt an amendment to the report and decision for Mildred Haley Phase 1, Chapter 121A, approving the delegation of authority of Mildred, Mildred Haley 121A Corporation with respect to Phase 2 and Phase 3 of the project and to take all related actions. John. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamas and Director Jemison. My name is Jonathan Spillane, and I'm an attorney in the Office of General Counsel. For you today is the request for authorization to approve the First Amendment to the report and decision for the Mildred Haley Chapter 121A project located in Jamaica Plain. This project relates to the approximately 6.9 acre portion of Mildred C. Haley Apartments, residential development in the uh, Jamaica Plain neighborhood of Boston and it was a result of the designation by the Boston Housing Authority through two separate requests for proposal processes. The Mildred Haley 121A project is a multi-phase project which consists of 673 units at various affordable income levels. The uh, Mildred Haley 121A project received master plan approval from the board on April 15th, 2021. Additionally, at the meeting on April 15th, the board approved the delegation of authority from the applicant for phase 1A and 1B. To provide further background, on April 15th, the BRA voted to adopt the report and decision for the Mildred uh, Haley 121A project. As a result, Mildred Haley 121A Corporation, the applicant was designated as the Chapter 121A entity for the project with consideration that the applicant would be able to delegate its authority for each phase of the project. On January 12, 2024, Mildred Haley 121A Corporation, the applicant filed their application for approval of delegation of 121A authority in a supplemental filing containing entity and organizational documents. The application seeks BPDA board approval for the following. Approval of the First Amendment to the report and decision for the Mildred Haley 121A project to approve the delegation of authority for Mildred Haley 121A Corporation to Mildred Haley 2 Limited Partnership for Phase 2 of the project and to Mildred Haley 3 Limited Partnership for Phase 3 of the Mildred Haley 121A project. Please note that the affordability restrictions for this project will remain unchanged. The General Council of the BPDA has determined that the changes set forth in the 121A application for delegation of authority and related matters pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 121A do not collectively constitute a fundamental change in accordance with the Acts of 1960, Chapter 652, Section 13A. Based on the foregoing, staff recommends approval of the adoption of the First Amendment to the report and decision for Mildred Haley 121A project delegating authority for Phase 2 and Phase 3 of the project. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? <clears throat> Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Okay. Um, item number 26. <clears throat> 
request authorization to enter into an affordable housing agreement and restriction in connection with the creation of two IDP units located at 43 through 47 Fremont Street and to take all related actions. Caitlin. Thank you for your continued time tonight, Madam Chair and members of the board. Again, I'm Caitlin Coppinger, Deputy Director of Comprehensive Planning. Tonight, I'm here to request your vote on an affordable housing agreement for the proposed development of 43 to 47 Fremont Street. Uh, this proposal, uh, although did not trigger Article 80 review, but due to its size, the project team um, is asked to restrict two units under the inclusionary development policy. Um, so therefore, the vote in front of you tonight will allow the agency to enter into an agreement to dedicate uh, two of these home ownership units under the IDP program, one at 80% AMI and one at 100% AMI. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Ms. Mark? Aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Caitlin. Item number 27, request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the proposed notice of project change and reconfiguration of interior spaces and programs for the development located at 100 through, through 114 Hamden Street and to take all related actions. Quinn. Thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Polimus and Director Jemison. The proposal I'll bring before you now is located at 110 to 114 Hampton Street in the New Market area. On December 11, 2023, the proponent submitted a notice of project change to the BPDA. In response to recent changes in the cannabis cultivation market, the proponent is seeking to make certain interior and programmatic changes to the approved project. Specifically, the NPC reconfigures interior space and modifies the programming for the approved project with a more diverse mix of retail uses on the ground floor, including cannabis retail, a reduced and reconfigured scope of cannabis production and cultivation space on the second and third floors, and employee training space and open space on the upper level. The approved building envelope will remain unchanged with on-site parking being reduced by one space. On January 4th, 2024, the BPA convened a public meeting. The public meeting was advertised in the local newspaper, uh, posted on the BPDA website, and distributed to the BPDA Roxbury email list. The public comment period ended on January 12th, 2024. I now turn it over to my colleague, Ted Schwartzberg, from the BPA Zoning Compliance Team to discuss the planning context considering the review of this project before the development team begin their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, Ted Schwartzberg, uh, Zoning Compliance Planner, uh, wanted to run through two slides that guided uh, our work as planners. Uh, Right now, uh, two different zoning articles informed our work. Uh, article 50, which is the current zoning, and Article 90, which is the new new market zoning, uh, which will go into effect next week. Uh, the planning that guided this was planned new market, which I had the pleasure of presenting to you all uh, back in August. And um, as uh, plan East Boston was uh, presented earlier tonight, we're thrilled on the new market team that our recently adopted plan is uh, now seeing the fruit of our labor and some investment in the neighborhood. Uh, other policy and regulations that were relevant were BTD complete streets and parking guidelines, electrical vehicle charging guidelines, uh, and this context is that it's right in New Market on the edge of Roxbury. On the map on the next slide, please, you'll see that this is in the planning area that we named the Gateway Industrial Zone, and uh, the dimensions that are proposed and the uses uh, are all uh, perfectly aligned with the planning goals for this area. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of zoning compliance, um, the Zoning Commission adopted uh, or voted on our new zoning last week. Uh, that, was the, um, that was the implementation of the plan that you adopted in August. Uh, it will go into effect next week. And so under the current zoning at this moment, uh, it triggers a conditional use for cannabis use as well as some dimensional violations. Uh, but then, uh, as of next week, for Article 90, the new new market zoning, um, <clears throat> the dimensions and uses are all well aligned with zoning, uh, and the only zoning relief needed will be for cannabis use. Uh, and we're thrilled uh, that manufacturing, processing, distribution, and job training, uh, which were primary goals in the new market plan, are being implemented through this proposal. Uh, and the plan also encourages active ground floor use where it's feasible for industrial uses, which this team is undertaking here. Uh, and then finally, um, 
this is uh, consistent with all the dimensions as proposed through Plan New Market. Uh, and with that, I'll close out the planning sites. Thank you very much. The development team can start their presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Secretary Paul Nemes, Director Jemison, members of the board, Attorney Joe Hanley, McDermott, Colty Miller, and Hanley in Boston. Um, very pleased and honored to be back here for this notice of project change. I am here with the client team, Mario Signore, who is the principal of Greenline Boston, uh, Craft Cannabis, uh, Kim Napoli, who is our cannabis counsel, my co counsel on this and uh, Eddie uh, McKay, who is from uh, WR2 and Partners Architect to answer any questions. Uh, just to take you through uh, the beginning of this presentation very briefly and then hand it over to Mario uh, to show you some of these updates. Next slide, please. So as, uh, as Quinn indicated and, uh, and, and Ted spoke to, uh, the, the genesis for these changes uh, was due to, or is due to, some changes in the cultivation market uh, for the cannabis industry, which has seen some retraction. Um, but I think more importantly, it's the opportunity for this project to even improve and better align with uh, Plan New Market, as we, as we heard from from Ted, uh, by adding a more diverse mix of uh, uses, still retaining cultivation, its job creation, but adding uh, retail and uh, training space within the approved uh, building. Um, as Ted mentioned as well, uh, we have been approved already by the Zoning Board of Appeal for the footprint of this new um, three-story industrial commercial building. Uh, that all remains the same. The changes are all within uh, the approved envelope and then we'll be returning to the Board of Appeal to add uh, the retail use on the ground floor as part of uh, the notice of project change. I want to thank um, the BPDA, I want to thank Stephen Harvey, our project manager, uh, for his stewardship and uh, to Ted Schwartzberg uh, for helping us with this notice of project change as well as Alexa Pinard. Uh, we are very excited and uh, I think what is most important is that uh, these changes will allow this project to proceed as also supported uh, by the community and the new market bid. Um, so I'd like to ask Mario Signore to just go through the presentation very quickly for you. Mario? I'd just, I'd just like to quickly echo Joe's sentiments and thank the board, Ted, and Stephen Harvey, and everybody for helping us, working with us on this project to make it where it is now. Uh, I'll jump right in. Um, all right, if you look right now, you'll see what is an aerial view of the lot in discussion. You can see it's in an industrial area with parking lots, industrial recycling, waste management. Uh, there is a commercial development to the west for FW Web, and there's also a small park to the west. Uh, if go to the next slide, please. Sorry, I lost you there. All right, great. Uh, these are the current conditions right now. The lot is used for housing, construction equipment, uh, it's not contributing to the neighborhood or the community in any way. Developing this lot with our current project will create a beacon for Boston to enter the cannabis industry. Instead of jobs and opportunities only open to people that live hours away or that have cars, we're bringing it right to Boston, right to the community. Developing this site will create jobs, opportunity, and security. Next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, it's the, this is the same footprint that was already approved. Nothing has changed except that we've added a more diverse use uh, that opens up the ground floor and this building to the community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, same thing, this is just an aerial view. You can see the top floor, train space, the footprint and the structure and height and shape of the building has not changed at all from what was approved. Next slide, please. Again, no real changes to the original project, same footprint, same height on the elevations that you're looking at right now. We've just added more windows. Uh, we've improved the landscaping through uh, suggestions from the BPDA. We had a green roof and more entrances. We made it look more like a building that serves the community. Even though it's an industrial manufacturing cultivation building, it looks like it's something that's open and welcoming to the neighborhood. It's not just a manufacturing facility. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a rendering what the building will look like if you're traveling Hampton Street to the south. 
Next slide, please. Here's a rendering of the building. If you're looking north on Hampton Street, you can see the new public components to it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and here's a rendering if you're driving up Norfolk Street heading west. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, if you want to go to the, the end, I'd just like to pass it back to BPD. And thank you for everyone who's stuck around this evening for this. Thank you, Mario. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes our presentation. Yeah, awesome. Uh, OK, any questions or comments from the board? All right, I just want to say that this, I love how we're starting to really see all these plans aligning with these projects, like so, uh, you know, like they should. <laughs> um, and I, you know, this was easy because we've been familiar with the projects we, we've talked, not the project, but like the, uh, the planning, right, for this. And we've discussed a lot of it and worked our way through that. And um, yeah, uh, let's take a vote. So moved. Okay. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Dr. Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Woo! <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So a little, a little movie. <laughs> there, um, okay. So 27. Okay. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the proposed notice of project change and reconfiguration of interior spaces and programs for all wait, for the development located at 100 through 114, yeah, 114 Hampton Street, and to take all related actions. Quinn, did I read the right one? That's okay. the one we just did, Madam Chair. I'm like, why does that sound so familiar? Okay, thank you. Um, 28, request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the proposed notice of project change and construction of 16 residential, residential home ownership units, including two IDP units, two IDP home ownership units, 16 car parking spaces, and 42 bicycle parking spaces located at 804 East 7th Street and to take all related actions. Quick. Thank you one last time this evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Palimus and Director Jemison. The proposal I bring before you now is 804 East 7th Street in South Boston. On November 17th, 2023, the BPA accepted a notice of project change from Cabot Ronan LLC in connection with the approved project. The NPC proposes a transfer in ownership from 804 East 7th Street LLC to Ro Cabot Ronan LLC, the reconfiguration of interior building space across all floors, resulting in a reduction of the number of residential units from 21 to 16, with a commensurate reduction in the number of IDP units from three to two, a reduction in off-street vehicle parking spaces from 21 to 16, and an increase in the number of interior bike parking spaces from 21 to 32, with an additional 10 outdoor visitor bicycle spaces. On January 3rd, 2024, the BPDA held a public meeting where the project was positively received by those present, the meeting was advertised in local newspapers, posted on the BPDA website, and a notification was emailed to all subscribers of BPDA's South Boston and South Boston Waterfront neighborhood update lists. The public comment period ended on January 10th, 2024. I now have to turn it over to my colleague Ford Del Vecchio from the BPDA zoning compliance team to discuss the planning context considered in the review of this project before the development team begins our presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Polimus, members of the board, and Director Jemison. My name is Ford Del Vecchio, and I'm the BPDA Zoning Compliance Reviewer assigned to this project. BPDA planners use the zoning, citywide plans and policies, local context, as well as community feedback in order to review the proposed project during the review process. The proposed project is located in a multifamily residential subdistrict of the South Boston Neighborhood Zoning District. The site spans the full block between East 7th and East 6th Street, adjacent to, the Columbia, to Columbia Road a major parkway. This section of the South Boston is characterized by three and four story residential uses with intermittent ground floor retailers. These include restaurants, retail, salons, and banks. There are also several civil, civic uses in the area, including the Oliver Hazard Perry School and the Francis L. Murphy Skating Rink to the north. Immediately across Columbia Road from the proposed project is the M Street Beach public open space. No recent neighborhood plans are relevant to the project site. 
So planning staff reviewed this project within the context of existing the existing built environment and citywide plans and policies, including policies such as complete streets, imagine Boston 2030, go Boston 2030, and housing Boston 2030. Next slide, please. The proposed project seeks to reuse an existing two-story nursing home through a change of occupancy to multifamily residential and the addition of a third floor. The overall site plan is largely consistent with the existing condition as the proposed project retains the current building footprint. In response to staff and community feedback, the proponent has made several design updates over the course of the review process. The proponent has reduced a number of units from 21 to 16, uh, parking units from 21 to 16. In addition, the proponent changed the composition of many of the units from one bedroom I'm to like two. They could have gotten two no more than a units. couple of inches, but people okay. making it sound like. Thank you. And now we'll turn it over to the development team to present the project in more detail. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, this is Shane Lowesey with Chew and Company Architects. Um, thank you. Uh, so this is the proposed project. It's a, as mentioned before, it was an existing nursing home that spans from 7th Street to 6th Street, taking up the whole block. Um, it's a, actually an existing three stories. Uh, we're not adding a third story. The three stories already exist. Um, so we're working mostly within the complete interior of the existing shell. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's the building from a bird's eye view. Uh, you can see the waterfront and the yacht clubs in the foreground and the building beyond, again, stretching from um, East 6th Street to 7th Street. So this project previously came before the board. Um, the differences this time are reducing the unit count from 21 units previously to 16 and matching the same number with the parking, so 16 spaces. Um, after talking to the community, we've increased the number of family size units from two, bed, uh, two bedroom to three bedroom units from 11 previously to 16 now. Um, we've increased the bike parking to over a two to one ratio for bike parking spaces, two units, um, including 10 outdoor visitor spaces. We've also created bike paths that connect along the sides of the building from 7th Street to 6th Street. Um, one side is accessed through a path that has a stair, and the other side is accessed through a accessible compliant ramp that goes the whole span of the building. Um, we're also proposing to widen the sidewalks, add street trees, and add landscaping um, to more of an extent than was previously proposed. Uh, we're adding a small addition off of the side on the East 6th Street, yeah, excuse, East 6th Street side um, to accommodate the parking garage. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the existing front facade of the nursing home. Um, on the top of the page, you can see the three-story structure and then angles shots from the left and right to the right of it. On the bottom right of the page is the existing rear of the structure along East 6th Street, where it fronts two stories. So it basically changes height um, of almost a story and a half from 7th Street to 6th Street. Next slide, please. This is the proposed site plan. So East 7th Street is on the right, East 6th Street is on the left. Uh, we see the expanded sidewalks. We see the added street trees. Um, on the top of the page, there is the proposed ramp that will connect 6th Street with 7th Street. Um, this is dual purpose. It actually allows for bikes to come in on either street and access to have access to the bike room that's towards the center front of the building. Uh, we can see the small second floor addition on the bottom left of the building. Um, this is again to accommodate the double loaded parking garage that we're proposing. We're proposing to add some small bal balconies off the front of the building and there's an existing balcony that runs off for the entire inset of the middle of the building where the three street trees are, where the three trees are in the middle of the, the plan here. Next slide, please. So on the top is the first floor plan that 
comes in off of 7th Street. Uh, the light blue are the bike rooms that now have access from both sides or from both streets, um, which previously it was only, you could only access the bike room from 7th Street, so now we will access from both 7th and 6th. Uh, on the ground floor, we have uh, four units, and then we have added amenity space and added storage space for the unit owners. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, sorry, stay here. But can I go back one? I'm sorry. Uh, bottom is the second floor plan with the garage that it, the fronts off of 6th Street. So we see the parking in the back, and then we have some units towards the front, and then the upper floor from this is just residential units. Next slide, please. Uh, and so here we have the updated renderings of what the building looks like. One big item from the neighborhood was that they wanted to fit more within the context of the existing um, built environment. So that's what we're trying to do with this elevation. We're replacing the EFIS coining and cornice with uh, cedar shingle, and we're adding decks and the center bay to the building along 7th Street. On the rear of the building, we're keeping the existing masonry, uh, removing the EFIS coining and cornice, and adding window openings to help um, make this a much more attractive facade. We're also adding a lot of plantings uh, to the right. On the left, there's an existing transformer that's just sort of open to the street, so we're looking to enclose that a little bit and clean it up and plant around it in order to make it look a little better. Next slide, please. Um, and these are the, is the side elevations, so you can kind of see the grade change from 6th Street to 7th Street. On the top, 6th Street is on the left, 7th Street is on the right. Uh, most of the openings are of the existing windows, so we're just trying to reuse as much as possible. Um, so there aren't any too many more windows being cut into what you see here. Um, next slide, please. And again, it's just another rendering of the proposed building within context of the existing buildings along 7th Street. Next slide, please. And the same for the rear at uh, 6th Street. And I believe that was the last slide, so we can take any questions that anybody has. Awesome, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Um, I just want to commend you guys on the um, on the design. I really like the front of it and how it you know how it ties all into the into the neighborhood. And um, big fan of the um, uh, three bedroom unit to um, accommodate our our family population. So absolutely, thank you. Well, cool. So if there are no other questions, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. You. Thank you. Okay. Let's make sure I'm scrolling to the right item. I put my glasses on. Um, item number 33, correct? Correct. Request authorization to execute a Second Amendment and Restated Cooperation Agreement for the 3531 through 3541 Washington Street, 141 McBride Street, and 45 Burnett Street project in Jamaica Plain, and repurpose $100,000 in mitigation funds from the project toward an updated, toward updating an existing streetscape to improve safety and efficiency in the drop-off zone for students at English High School and to take all related actions. Erin. Erin? Can you hear me? No, well, yeah, I can now, yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hemus, and Director Jemison. I'm Erin Hawkins, Assistant Compliance Manager for the BPDA. I'm tonight, I'm tonight here to request the director be authorized to execute, deliver a second amended and restated co-op agreement for the 3531-41 Washington Street, 141 McBride Street, 45 Burnett Street project in Jamaica Plain. 
on the 13th of November, 2014, the BRA, uh, now doing business as the BPDA board, voted to approve the 3521-29 Washington Street project containing approximately 313,000 square feet comprised of three buildings, 0.44 acre community garden and open space, and 166 parking spaces. The project was to include 126 units, including 19 IDP units. The BRA and JP Property One LLC, SSG JP Lot Two LLC, and SSG JP Lot Three LLC entered into a first amended co op agreement as of October 26, 2017, in connection with the project. On November 13, 2014, when this project was approved by the board, contribution the amount of $100,000 for the purpose of extending the Southwest Corridor Park was included in the approved suite of mitigation commitments. This $100,000 requires repurposing, given the fact that the original purpose is no longer a prior priority for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR. To that end, English High School was identified as needing costly streetscape improvements to assist with drop-off and pickup, ADA compliance on the streetscape, and associated accessibility issues. The staff recommends that the BPDA authorize the director to issue a second amended co-op agreement in order to repurpose this $100,000 in mitigation funds from the project toward updating the existing streetscape adjacent to English High in order to improve safety and the efficiency of the drop-off slash pickup of its students. At a minimum, this will include new ADA compliant sidewalks in front of the high school along McBride Street. This may also include a bus stacking lane along McBride Street pending BTD, PIC, and any other necessary agency approvals. I'm glad to answer any questions or concerns you may have in this regard. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, yeah. any, any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. I'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Ms. Mark? Aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 34. Request authorization to disperse $200,000 to 26 nonprofit community organization from the Harvard Alston Partnership Fund and to take all related actions. Aaron. Thanks again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamas and Director Jemison. Um, here again tonight to request that the uh, BPDA authorize disbursement of a total of $200,000 to 26 nonprofit community organizations. The funds will be dispersed from the Harvard Alston Partnership Fund, maintained by the BPDA from contributions made by Harvard University. The Harvard Alston Partnership Fund was originally established by the cooperation agreement by and between the BRA and the President and Fellows of Harvard College, dated April 2nd, 2008, to address the development impact of Harvard University's Alston Science Complex located on Western Avenue in Alston. In the Harvard Science Complex Co-op Agreement, Harvard funded $100,000 per year for five years to the fund. Harvard has since committed to extending the fund for an additional 10 years through $500,000 associated with the Fifth Amendment to the Harvard IMP, approved by the BRA on March 14, 2013, 2013 sorry, and with a co-op agreement dated January 2, 2014, and $500,000 associated with the approval of Harvard's 2013 IMP, approved by the BRA on October 17, 2013, and with a co-op agreement dated July 10, 2014. An additional $100,000 was added to the 2022 uh, partnership fund, that's year 15, distribution associated with the Harvard 92 Seattle Street IMP amendment and associated co-op agreement, with a total of $200,000 being deployed in year 15. The fund was further extended for 2023, year 16, with one year of $200,000 in funding associated with the BPDA approval of the Harvard 175 North Harvard Street Institutional Project, which is the ART in Harvard University Housing Associated IMP Amendment on November 16th of this past year. The fund is maintained and accounted for by the BPDA, and disbursements from the fund require approval of our agency. A process for disbursement of the fund has been established whereby the Harvard Alston Partnership Fund Advisory Committee conducts an annual public process to invite nonprofit organizations that serve the North Alston North Brighton community to apply for funding. Grants from the fund are intended to support educational, cultural enrichment, neighborhood improvement programs, and projects in the North Alston North Brighton neighborhood. 
nonprofits submit applications describing their proposed programs and funding requests. The advisory committee reviews the applications and determines which applications to support. Finally, the advisory committee forwards its recommendations to the BPDA requesting disbursements from the fund. This vote will be the 16th authorization for disbursement from this fund. For this year's grant cycle, the advisory committee issued a request for proposals inviting nonprofit organizations that serve the North Austin Dash North Brighton community to apply for funding. The RFP was widely advertised, including the placement of advertisements in local newspapers and more than 150 local nonprofit organizations serving the North Austin Dash North Brighton neighborhood were notified directly. Technical assistance was offered to all interested applicants. On November 20th, 2023, after review, reviewing and considering all qualified applications, the advisory committee voted to recommend that the BPDA authorize the expenditure of $200,000 from the fund to support 26 applications for funding, as you can see detailed in the memo. Once again, I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns you may have in this regard. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. William Clark. Aye. Mr. Shepherd. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Item number 35, request authorization for the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency to delegate to the Office of the General Counsel the authority to respond to the open meeting law complaint regarding the BPDA's Article 80 review process and the BPDA board's approval of the Constitution Inn project located at 153rd Avenue in Charlestown. Lisa. Good evening, uh, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hemus, and Director Jameson. My name is Lisa Harrington. I am the general counsel for the BPDA. Um, I am here before you tonight to request that the board delegate to the office of the general counsel the authority to respond to the open meeting law complaint regarding the BPDA's Article 80 review process and the board's approval of the Constitution Inn project at 153rd Ave in Charlestown. On December 22nd, 2023, the BPDA received an open meeting law complaint from a group called the Neighborhood Voice Alliance, Inc. Pursuant to the complaint, they have alleged that the BPDA violated the open meeting law in two instances. First, when it held a public community meeting on October 19, 2023, to discuss the Constitution and project, and second, when the project was brought before this board for approval at the December 14th board meeting. The Office of the Attorney General oversees the open meeting law and pursuant to the regulations when faced with an open meeting law complaint, a public body is instructed to meet to review the allegations, take remedial action if appropriate, and send the complainant a response. Um, in this case, the Neighborhood Voice Alliance has alleged that the October BPDA sponsored public community meeting was conducted in violation of the open meeting law that the December 14th board meeting at which the project was considered by this board was improperly noticed and that the board's consideration of the project was procedurally improper. The Office of the General Counsel has reviewed the complaint and does not believe that any of the allegations have merit. In short, the October community meeting was not a meeting of this public body and therefore is not subject to the open meeting law and the December 14th board meeting was properly noticed and the proper procedures were followed by this board when it considered and approved the Constitution and project. As there were no violations of the open meeting law, there are no remedial actions for this board to take. Accordingly, I'm here to request that the board delegate to the general counsel the authority to respond to the complaint, which we will do uh, by written letter to the complaining party and to the attorney general's office. I am happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. William Smirk. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Um, thanks, Lisa, keep us up to date. Thank Let you. us know if there's anything we can do I to, will. you know, contribute, but. Uh, Appreciate that, thank you. Um, okay, let's go to item number 36, personnel, uh, Mike. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Madam Secretary, and Director Jemison. Uh, we have uh, two items for your consideration on the BRA agenda with exact details uh, included in the board memo. We have two departures. In the design department, Matthew Martin, senior urban designer, and in the real estate, depart real estate department, John Fitzgerald, deputy director of real estate operations. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Mike. Uh, item number seven, number 37. Uh, contractual, I need a motion to pay the bills. I move that we pay our bills. Second that. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Ms. Bennett. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Please pay the bill. And finally, director's update. Uh, Director Jemison, uh, floor is yours. Thanks and good evening. <laughs> Very much appreciate uh, the, the work of this board all, at all times. Um, happy January. It's good to see you. Um, a few highlights from tonight. Um, six development projects, 349 units, 112 income restricted units, uh, which comprise 32% of the total units approved. Um, we've got $581 million worth of uh, developer's cost estimate tonight, representing 1.2 million square feet of uh, development, uh, which we estimate will put 1,150 tradespeople to work. Uh, I want to highlight a few of the key projects approved tonight. First, um, uh, I get to celebrate a plan with you. Um, I want to congratulate the entire team behind the adoption tonight of Plan East Boston, also known as East Boston Tomorrow, adopted by the board this evening. Uh, after five years of work and engagement with the community, this report lays out a clear and ambitious vision for the neighborhood and is deeply informed by the priorities of its residents. Plan focuses on increasing affordable housing and, and neighborhood climate change uh, preparedness, enhanced mobility and transit options, support for local businesses, and predictable and contextual growth. These goals cover residential areas, squares and corridors, uh, waterfront, uh, and the evolving industrial areas throughout East Boston. In addition, the board also adopted the updated zoning associated with the implementation of this plan, which will now need to be approved by the Zoning Commission. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to the community and the elected officials for their partnership through the process uh, since 2018. Uh, that we've been working on this together. Look forward to working together uh, throughout the plan implementation. Um, it's important to say, again, underline our uh, partnership with the local elected officials who were uh, crucial uh, to, um, to our ability to, uh, to have success in, in moving this forward tonight. Um, there's the Alston Bright Needs Assessment Report, which is also uh, covered. In planning news, the, the board adopted the needs assessment report as a result of 10 months of research and engagement. Uh, it identifies the gaps that exist in the neighborhood today and how future development also Brighton can provide significant opportunity for such things as increased housing, accessible public outdoor open spaces, and much more. It's really designed to help us uh, to create the kind of list of things that should be part of uh, mitigation and other, uh, and other um, improvements that are negotiated for in future work uh, on development, including uh, development uh, that involves uh, Harvard, is, which is one of the places that the impetus for the report came out of. Look forward to seeing the work that will result from this, and I want to thank the staff for the hard work on this. A um, couple of other uh, key things to talk about that are really important. Um, one thing that's great about this, uh, working in this agency, is that you are working in a um, in a continuum with a, a wide range of staff for present day, uh, recent, and, and uh, many years past. Um, one person I want to say thanks uh, to uh, who's re left us to this uh, t this week is Michelle Goldberg. Um, she's been our director of finance. Uh, she's been with the agency since 2016. At first, as our budget and procurement manager, uh, and then later she's promoted the director of finance. Under her leadership, we've adopted uh, a number of important changes: the equitable, equitable procurement plan, 
which has helped us address the barriers that have often kept minority women-owned businesses from participating in our contracting opportunities. Uh, she's opened up significant opportunities to MWB businesses in Boston and allowed investment in and expansion of a, a more diverse workforce. Uh, this work was recognized, uh, hasn't gone unnoticed, it was recognized by the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce uh, last year. Um, with the Paysetters Award for Minority Business Enterprise Partnership of the Year. Um, in addition, uh, she's been crucial to our work on producing a reliable budget, uh, managing our finances, passing our audit, uh, and also crucial to our work on programs like MassWorks, where she's had a huge and positive impact. I want to say thank you to Michelle uh, upon her departure. Um, and again, uh, to my earlier point about the continuum that we're in, I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge we lost two former leaders of this agency in different capacities last month. Uh, Muhammad Ali Salam and Stephen Coyle uh, both passed away uh, in late December or early January. <clears throat> Muhammad was a leader at the BPDA during his years here uh, as Deputy Director of Special Projects, about one of the few uh, people of color who were in this agency when I worked here, uh, and he'd been here for years before I arrived. He opened doors for many people um, uh, in the agency uh, at that time and after. I uh, was committed to giving community members a voice in the planning and zoning of their neighborhoods. Um, he, um, he worked in, in every kind of neighborhood in the city, uh, from Roxbury and Mattapan to Hyde Park and West Roxbury, uh, and, and was very much loved in each of those places. Uh, a crucial kind of person who works uh, in this agency, uh, who it's really my pleasure to lift up and, and uh, acknowledge. Um, I also want to say, because although I did not know him quite as well, certainly in his work here at the BPDA, although I had a chance to work with him, uh, believe it or not, in Detroit, Michigan, um, we're, the development community is going to miss, uh, and we want to send our condolences out to the family of, of uh, Muhammad Ali Salam. We also want to send a similar uh, signal to um, Stephen Coyle, um, who led the BPD within BRA uh, under, under May. Raymond Flynn uh, from 1984 to 1992. Among his many contributions to the city of Boston, Director Coyle was instrumental in the revitalization of the Charlestown Navy Yard, uh, worked to establish the Harbor Walk in addition to approving uh, over 150 other significant projects. Um, he also uh, had an important role in empowering uh, the, uh, the various communities in the city uh, through a program in the 80s um, that was the you parcel-to-parcel know, parcel linkage um, it, there's so many things, Article 80, there's so many things that, uh, that Director Coyle um, brought into the common parlance of the development industry, and expectations that were set through uh, the things that he fought for, um, and really uh, helping to shape the way the city looks and feels today. Um, I also had a chance to work with him, uh, not, not to work with him in another city, uh, as he helped uh, through AFL-CIO, the second major engagement of, of his career after uh, um, after leading the BPDA, um, to s sort of see what he was able to do in that organization. Um, he leaves a lot of uh, people uh, there also, uh, and has a significant legacy uh, in his work uh, in that area. So hopefully people were able to see some of the obituaries and other recognitions of these two important leaders who passed, uh, but I wanted to make sure that I shared and highlighted that with the board um, and said thank you uh, to them and their families for uh, sharing their time with us. Um, those are the end of my comments, um, but I know that certainly other people may have comments on any of the um, board items or people that I mentioned uh, in my comments. Uh, thank you so much, Director Jemison. Um, uh, would anyone have, like, you say? <laughs> well, both of the uh, gentlemen you mentioned uh, had a major impact on planning decisions across the city um, and were uh, innovative and inclusive um, and really provided great leadership uh, to the organization. And uh, I think we all extend uh, our best wishes and gratitude to their families uh, for all that uh, uh, these leaders provided the city of Boston. Thank you. Um, yeah, and just want to echo Dr. Landsmark. Um, sorry, I just got an emotional chair lady today. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, just want to thank 
the families uh, and the spirits of Muhammad and Stephen. And oh my gosh, Michelle. <laughs> um, again, just uh, I don't have words today really, but just it's been an incredible honor and a privilege to, to serve alongside you. Um, you have individually made such amazing impact. Um, but I think even, even more than that, or equally, um, you have led, uh, led in a remarkable way. Um, uh, and, and so you're leaving, uh, you're leaving the agency and I'm in such good shape. Um, and yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, super proud, <laughs> super proud to, uh, to call you a colleague forever um, and wish you the, the best of luck. So um, yeah, I think with that, let's go ahead and I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. Come on. Okay. <laughs> Roll call for okay. Ms. Bennett. Aye. Dr. Lance Clark. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Passes. We'll see you guys next month. Thank you, everyone. Great meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair.